or are and don't think they are. And just, I want to encourage you, if you get a red light, just move on. All right? <laughs> don't force people into the kingdom, but have an open invitation at wells like this. Because you never know if some snooty lady sitting next to a well will end up seeing a whole town saved. And then you see in the book of Acts, Philip following up on that work. And then Peter coming and solidifying that work in Samaria, which is, all of it is the wrong thing for Jews to do. But you see revival actually take place in that town twice because of what happened with this woman. So not just here, but in the book of Acts. Samaria was opened by Jesus in this story right here. And that's why Philip could go there when persecution started in Jerusalem. So you never know what one conversation can actually do. You don't know, a, a ticket to a healing event may seem um, campy to you. The tickets are super cool, by the way. <laughs> but somebody that has never seen that before, which is 80 to 90% of people, it may be their last best hope at getting a drink of water. So just pay attention, all right? So wherever you guys are, tomorrow during the day, take the time. Set aside time in your calendar. We're all learning how to use our calendars. 30 minutes to an hour. Go somewhere and even just sit and pray. And then if God highlights somebody, which means if God is asking you to talk to a stranger, which you normally don't do. If you're wondering, is God asking me to do that? Yes, he's asking you to do that because you normally don't think, I'm going to talk to a stranger. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, okay? A really easy way to figure it out. Just find your wells. Really, really simple way to figure that out, okay? Um, I think before I introduce Joe Sheen, did he call moderate? Okay, I only missed this chance. All right, so Joe has been an uh, amazing spiritual mom to us. Um, apostolic and everything she puts her hands to. She runs an amazing ministry called Agape Freedom Fighters, which we somehow tiptoed around when we were doing Saturate and then ended up connecting with Joe, and Joe really likes us, so we really, <laughs> we really love her, and she's just been behind us the whole time. No matter what crazy stuff we decide to do, um, she's believed in us and loved us, and I'd love for you guys to stand to your feet and give her a huge hand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, so good to see you. I thought everybody was facing in, so I went and sat by Jess. She's all, no, no, you're going up there. I'm all, oh, it's like formal, totally formal. Do you want me to stand up? Is that better for your camera? Okay, cool. Right on. Um, oh, I'm good. I can sit in a while. I'll stand up for a little bit. Um, let me uh, say this. I love the Bible. Um, so many times um, we get super wacky about healing. Actually, it might be easier if I say it. Um, we get really wacky about healing, and people get out there, and they start doing stuff that actually isn't biblical. So um, I am the furthest from religion you will ever meet in your life. But I came out of religiousness, and uh, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not religious. But I do love the Word of God. So I was praying this morning about what to present to you because we have a limited amount of time. I could teach you on healing for a whole month and never scratch the surface. There's so much that God says about healing, and then he says, come with childlike faith. That's, that's how it works. But I felt like it was important for this crew because I feel like you are all carrying something very important that's going to birth fourth revival. And you hear me talk about that on Friday, uh, tomorrow night, uh, what I believe God is birthing in the season. Um, and I know it's on Parker and Jesse ever since I met them. And so that means it's on all of you because now you're running as one family. So with that said, I felt like the Lord wanted me to introduce the biblical basis for healing for y'all before we get going on how you do it. Is that fair? I don't normally do that, but uh, it must be Parker. He must be praying. I don't know what's happening. So, Father, we just thank you right now that your word never returns void. And I thank you, Father, that your spirit is here. God, I thank you for these hungry hearts, sold out, passionate pursuers of you. God, uh, you call us by your name. And there is nothing better than that. Uh, Lord, you called us before the foundations of the earth for such a time as this. 
And Lord, you've extended your heart and your favor towards us. And you said that you are my witnesses, says the Lord, the ones who I'm chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he for before me, no other God was formed, nor will there ever be one after. And God, the position we have tonight is totally surrendered to you. You do what you want, God, but you ask us to be active participants in releasing the kingdom of heaven. So Father, tonight, would you come and would you have your way and would you wreck your sons and daughters in this room? Lord, wreck our paradigm, wreck our theology, wreck our religion, God, and meet us face to face with your living, breathing word by the power of your spirit in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. And Lord, would you launch us into this year of multiplication and acceleration because no eye has seen and no ear has heard what God has in store for those who love him. So in Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and the thanks ahead of time. And Lord, I just invite you to crash in like I always do. If you want to do something I'm not doing, then you just direct the traffic. Open our hearts, open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see, God, that you are beyond what we could hope, imagine, dream, or even think. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. You ready? Okay, either type fast or write fast, because I'm like a maniac. If, if I'm like, whoa, whoa, just put your hand up. If you're like, that was, oh, hallelujah, then you don't have to stress. Okay, there you go. All right, so God is a covenant God. Everything centers around covenant. Everything centers around the table of the Lord. If you didn't know that, uh, I mean, I could speak on that for the next 25 years. But the table of the Lord, why, you know, let me just say this. Why do you think that David is praying this prayer in Psalm 23 and the Lord talks about him dining at the table of the Lord in the presence of the enemy? And he's actually dining at the table with Jesus and the, the enemy's present. Because at the table is the bread, is the wine, is the, the, it's the whole tabernacle experience. If you look at the tabernacle in Exodus, there's a representation there of the table of God. I can't get into that. I know it's going to get hijacked over there. But take a look at Exodus and look at what's happening in the tabernacle. If you look at, it's the bread of the presence. What is the lamp? It's the oil. It's the Holy Spirit. And what is what, what is the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant? It's the Father. So we've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right from the get-go in Exodus. It is the representation of the table of the Lord. The covenant of communion is in the tabernacle. So everything we have been given in the authority and the power of Jesus stems from what was already accomplished from the very beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right? We're a Trinitarian theology, even if you don't see the Trinity as part of scripture in the Old Testament. It's still Trinitarianism because it's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so when we're looking at God as covenant God, we want to make sure we understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all in operation through the covenant and through our lives. Everything happens through Jesus because of the Father and the gift we've been given because of Jesus' sacrifice from the Father is the Holy Spirit. They are each the same substance, homoousis in the Greek. They're the same substance, but they are three persons. And if you can ever get your head around that, good luck. Greater <laughs> theologians have tried. But understanding that we're describing the triune Godhead as different elements of his divine nature. Okay. So God reveals himself. Why is that important? Because in, in Exodus, God reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, right? You know that. Okay, so covenant with the Israelites meant this. No disease is allowed. No disease is allowed in the camp. This is where you got to remember, where did it come from? We're not some whacked out charismatic group that believes in healing. This is Jehovah Rapha, who said there will be no disease in the camp. They had rules for that, okay? So they walk in obedience to the law, and then no disease can come in the camp because Jehovah Rapha said there's a provision of health and healing because you're mine. All right, that's where it starts. So because healing is a part of God's nature, it cannot be separated from him as other doctrines have tried to surmise. All right. 
Isaiah spoke of the coming Messiah and he pointed to the new covenant. Isaiah pointed to that, right? Isaiah 61. That would be visible through signs and wonders and miracles. So God's anointed Messiah would deliver the good news of the kingdom with power. And in the New Testament, we read the kingdom is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. Unfortunately, in most of our Western church doctrine, it's a matter of talking because teachers rule the churches, not apostles. In the early church, apostles were the head of the church and they were empowerers and launchers. That was the mission of Matthew 28. Go into all the world and make disciples, but you make disciples with moving by the word of God and in power, not standing up there talking about the Bible, but actually bringing the Bible to life through the authority and power of Jesus. So once apostles are put back in office in the church, you start to see this action happening again. Apostles and prophets were meant to be the heads of the church. Teachers and preachers are empowered and evangelists, but no three of those positions were meant to rule the church. It was supposed to be an empowering church that sent. Okay, so that's why you see a church void of power largely, because teachers need an audience. They don't want to empower anyone. Okay, there it is. Just insulted half the room. All right, in Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21, Jesus proclaims his assignment by quoting the very scriptures written by Isaiah describing the coming Messiah. You know, the good news. I'm going to preach the good news. He, he quotes the exact thing Isaiah said about him. And the ministry of healing is the central part of the gospel. It revolves around presenting something in power that leads people to salvation. Woman at the well is the greatest example. That word of knowledge led her to go, man, dude, you must be a prophet. But she is responsible in the Orthodox. I told the group this morning in the Orthodox church, there's a history of her. Her name is Fotina. And she actually is responsible for being the first apostle that led almost all of that area of Asia to Jesus. That's why there was a, was a revival in Acts. She was out there with her five kids. One was working for the Romans, and uh, the other was uh, her daughter actually was friends with Nero's daughter and led her to Christ, which led Nero to come after the family, and every one of them were persecuted. And every one of them was martyred. But she was responsible for bringing this great gospel in power uh, around the whole region. All right, so Christ's atonement activated what God had promised in his word. Christ's atonement triumphed over sickness and sin, proving both salvation and healing are available through his completed work on the cross. But in Western theology, we've separated the healing over there and we've said you can be saved, but you can't be healed. God, if it be your will. Well, it's his will, okay? It's in, it's in the word. All right, Matthew 10, verse 1. Disciples are given, look that up. Disciples are given authority over unclean spirits to expulse them, cure sickness and disease. Because Jesus said, I command you, I'm commanding you to preach, to heal, to cast out demons, to cleanse lepers and raise the dead. So it's not up to the exorcists in some other religion to raise the dead. It's the people of God carrying the power of his spirit, which is everyone in this room has a power to raise the dead. Sometimes the dead are walking around and sometimes they're flat out in a morgue. But you have the power, the resurrection power that raised him, raised him from the dead. You have that within you. Okay, so widespread, widespread scriptural evidence, foundational truth, the nature of God to heal, part of the divine covenant, and an essential fact of Christ's atonement is the undergirding for why healing matters in our whole process of Christianity. It's demonstrated in consistent historical evidence across centuries, denominations, and theological presuppositions. If you travel outside the U.S., where the Western culture is not evident, you see it everywhere. Right. In Africa, it's common to raise the dead. Right. Here, we're like, raise the dead? What's that, man? <laughs> I won't even pray for somebody with a cut finger. Like, no. <laughs> so it's all about what you have been steeped in. And we've been steeped in a lie. 
in this country in a lot of denominations. And then in some other denominations, we've made it so weird that everyone goes running, screaming the other way, like, I'm not going to be that weird person. <laughs> All right. In the Old Testament, Testament, Jehovah Rapha in Exodus 15, 26 can actually be translated from the Greek as I am the Lord, your doctor. Get out of here. Come on. I am the Lord, your doctor. Strong's concordance. The Hebrew word heal, rapa, R-A-P-A, means this. To mend, to cure, to heal, to make whole, to repair. Anybody not get it? Like I love this because there's no excuse. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. So when people go, oh, Jesus doesn't heal today. I don't know what Bible they're reading. <laughs> All right, so the first promise of God healing his people, Exodus 15, 26. In Abraham's prayer, God healed, write these down. Abraham's prayer, God healed Abimelech in Genesis 20. These are things people just gloss over. They actually don't even look at it. He healed Miriam's leprosy. Remember that one? In Numbers 12. Hezekiah, interestingly enough, was healed through medicine. So here's what we do in the charismatic stream. We're like, God's going to heal me. And God's like, you should go to the doctor. And the person's like, no, God's going to heal me. And God's like, you should go to the doctor. Sometimes medicine is used because God wants to witness to those doctors. Sometimes it's and both. Sometimes it's not medicine. It's supernatural. But when you throw everything off to the side, you're missing the point. The point is salvation. God wants everyone to see his supernatural power. And sometimes he'll use your sickness to send you to the doctor. Man, my doctors interviewed me five times. They couldn't figure it out. They kept going, this is not, this is not possible. I'm like, Jesus, Jesus, I don't know what you want me to say. How did you go, how'd you go off all those meds? Like you should be in a psych ward. Well, it's just Jesus. That's not possible. I go, I just told you. And then they asked me, well, when the power of God hit you, was it like when you do acupuncture and they put those little electric clips on your ears? I was like, no. No, it wasn't. It was like stick both fingers and hands in a light socket times a thousand. And they were like, no way. <laughs> all right. So the Lord who heals you of all your diseases is Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. And we see Elijah and Elisha raising the dead in 2 Kings chapter 4. Bless you. All right. So the promise of God's protection, the Lord who heals all your diseases in Psalm 91. How many of you have ever gone through a hard time with your family or yourself and you're like Psalm 91 all day long? That's part of the healing atonement, Psalm 91. All right. So the covenant. Old Testament contains different covenants, four of them God made with the nation of Israel. The first one is Mosaic, and it's conditional on obedience bringing blessing, right? It's similar to what we see unfold in Psalm 133, where Aaron, the high priest, is being obedient, ministering to the Lord. They're unified around that prayer to the Lord. Then an anointing is released. Then God says how it's more beautiful than the dew on Mount Hermon. And then the Lord says that this oil, right? The anointing rolls down all the way into the robes. It's an abundant blessing. It's abundant pouring out an anointing. And then the Lord commands a blessing, life everlasting, right? So this goes with that obedience brings blessing. We don't, we're not obedient to God to get blessed. We're obedient to God because we love him. All right. It's not a formula. So um, three of the covenants are made between God and mankind in general that are not limited to Israel. And then we have the new covenant. And, and in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, that covenant is stated for all mankind. All right. So the promise of the new covenant eluded in Jeremiah 31, 34 B is this, the forgiveness of sins. That is directly tied to healing. You have been forgiven, and most people don't believe it. So they have a doorway in their soul, a soulish position, a soul wound that opens up the door to the demonic, opens up the door to sickness. When Jesus says you're forgiven, and it's alluded to in Jeremiah 31, and all over the New Testament, Jesus' teachings talk about 
being forgiven. Repent, turn, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And once you turn and you are forgiven, you don't walk anymore like one who is being persecuted. Otherwise, you've adopted the theology of the demons that you have to earn something, which probably 80% of Christians still believe. Um, all right, so in Jeremiah 31, there's the desire and the ability when you believe on God, you believe on Jesus to follow him. And in that moment of salvation, there's a heart change. And usually there's a zeal for obedience. Anyone have that? The minute you authentically started to follow the Lord, when you are baptized in the fire of God, baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's a whole different ballgame. So when people are not baptized, they try to just live a really good Christian life. And I always say, how's that working for you with all that hidden sin you have going on? Because you can't be a good person. You can only be more full of God and more intimate with him. And that just changes your entire nature, right? All right. So the ultimate fulfillment of every promise in the Old Testament is in Christ. And you'll find that for your further study in Hebrews 8, verses 7 through 13. Hebrews 9, just read the book of Hebrews, um, Hebrews 10, 11 through 24. All right, let me tell you a real quick story about religion versus relationships. So in the nation of Hungary, it is 95% Orthodox Catholic and 5% Calvinist. If there are any Jews, which there are, they don't count them because there's so few. And Charismatics are literally in the entire nation of Hungary, they believe the charismatics are under 40,000. They don't count them either. So what do you have there? You have Orthodox Catholics that largely don't believe in the charismata. They don't believe in the gifts of the spirit manifesting healing after the apostles died off. So you have a very religious nation. You have uh, it coming from Christian kings and you have a prime minister and a president, both Christians, both religious. One is Calvinist and one is Catholic, Orthodox Catholic. So the prime minister of Hungary, who is, uh, is uh, Gaspar uh, Orban, Orban is his name if you follow politics. Gaspar Orban is the man's son who's the prime minister. I met him at a meeting years ago and I saw the word president over his head bouncing back and forth. I was like, that's really strange. I saw him from the back and he had a ponytail and it was this, this meeting was in England. And uh, anyway, something crazy happened to him under the power of God, but it turned out that he was carrying revival for the nation of Hungary. I had no idea that his dad was the, was the prime minister. And Gashbar for the next five years uh, led a revolution of thousands and thousands and thousands of college kids and revival began all over college campuses, all over Hungary. Now that's a pretty big beast of, an, a, of a legacy of religion in a country, knowing that you are not represented at all. So they slandered him, slimed him, talked about his dad, but he was undaunted. We, we rented a riverboat, went up and down the Rhine, proclaiming Jesus loves Europe. And, you know, they, they kept at it. Today, uh, he's in a Calvinist seminary, which I was like, dude, it better be Jesus because that's the cemetery as far as I'm concerned. So he said, it is, Mama Jo, it is God. Uh, he went in the army. He is now a major in the army, and he's doing Calvinist seminary. He said, if I, if I hope to bring the passionate pursuit of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit, I must go into the worst of the enemy territory. So I believe he will be president. I'm absolutely sure of it, because I saw it over his head, uh, and that was six years ago. So they have other people now leading the college campuses. I'm telling you all of this because one person in this room can make that kind of difference. If you decide, okay, I, I'm not going to, my life's not my own anyway, so here I am. You moved, you moved here, for heaven's sake. So believe that God can use you to change an entire religious structure, but it's all by the power of love. One of the things that decimated Gaspar early on was he was in performance mode from the get-go because he was raised in a very high-performing family, very high profile. He was also a soccer star for a long time. So what people thought of him really mattered to him until Jesus healed him. And once Jesus healed him, he actually could fulfill the destiny. So whatever that hindrances you have in your life, uh, whatever trips you up, whatever things people say that just get you, get that stuff healed. 
quickly so that you can move forward, all right? Um, so the invisible triune Godhead is visible in Jesus Christ according to Colossians 1.15 and 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, because Jesus, you know this, but I'm going to say it again, is the exact representation of God's nature. He's the word of God made flesh. Some of you are going to teach this stuff, so write down these scriptures and save yourself some time. Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 1.3, John 1.14, and Revelation 19.13. And Jesus declared he could do nothing of himself, right? He only did what his father was doing, and, what, and he said what his father was saying. So in Isaiah 53, and its prophetic description of the suffering servant, it's the source of this massive theological debate that goes on today. But Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says this, by his wounds we are what? All right. The parallel verse of that is Matthew 8, 16 and 17 and 1 Peter 2, 24. I know I'm flying through this, but I want to give you a foundation. You guys do some homework. Like you look it up and you're going to be like, oh, that's what she meant. Okay. Um, let me touch on just a few pieces of historical evidence. How many of you ever read any books by Craig Keener? Theologian Keener? Hi you have. Yeah. Highly recommend his writings. He is a spirit-filled theologian and he's an amazing writer. So he said this quote, most scholars recognize that in the gospels, Jesus's miracles function as signs of the kingdom. But not everybody believes that. So that's according to Matthew 12, 28 and Luke eleven twenty. 20. So in the book, Christianizing the Roman Empire by the author McMullen, Christian miracles brought people to faith. What happened? We now try to get people to pray a great prayer. Confess Jesus, confess Jesus. I'll tell you what works, heal their knee and watch them give their life to God. And that, this whole thing got separated and it does not work because here's what I see all over Europe. It makes me insane. They go, Joe, are you going to take us out evangelizing? And I look at them, I go, no, your whole life is supposed to be evangelism. Why do you want me to take you to the streets? So you can look at everybody like they're a project and feel good for a couple hours because you're out there trying to lead people to Jesus. What the heck? Where is your, where is your witness? Your whole life in your cubicle at work, from shopping, getting your hair cut, getting your gas, that's evangelism. Your life should always be walking in tandem. And I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just saying, look, if you know God, then you know he wants to show up before you open your mouth because he's so good. So just be Jesus to everyone you meet. And then you have a witness because people will get saved because they're getting healed. But if you make evangelism a project, then we will forever be losing in Western Christianity. Because the minute you leave, those people aren't going to do it again. Because it's against our, it's against everything. That is not how Jesus lived. He didn't go, okay, boys, let's go evangelizing on Saturday afternoon from one to three. They lived it. They breathed it. The Holy Spirit was evident in everything they did. And that's evangelism. Game changer. All right. Um, man, I don't want to get into all the awakenings and all that. That'll take too long. Okay, I'm going to skip that. I'll leave that to Parker on another day. Um, okay, here's an interesting stat for you. You might not know this, but this stat is about 12 years old. But there's a survey of 1,000 American doctors, and, they, and this survey found that 73% believe healing miracles occur, and 55% said they have seen treatment results in their patients that they would consider miraculous. They just don't talk about it. More than 80% of Americans believe in the healing power of personal prayer. They could be atheists. Because the supernatural is mind-blowing to people. So that's why Wiccan continues to grow and the church continues to shrink. That's what we're here for. All right. So uh, some of you know the Bakers, you know Iris Ministries or Wilhart. So they established more than 10,000 churches in a very short period of time in Mozambique. Now, some of their churches are as big as this table, and they're like a little hut. So let's be fair. They're not building 10,000 buildings. They have pastors they raise up. But they have raised, 
by this point, I just saw Heidi not too long ago, they've raised more than 500 people from the dead. Now, it's not the bakers doing it. It's the people they've discipled who are doing it. The ones in the villages who are doing discipleship and doing evangelism as a lifestyle. That's why these people trust them. And when somebody dies, they all pray. And then these people are raised to life. So some of you don't know Leif Hetland. He uh, has an amazing worldwide ministry, but he runs a lot with Randy Clark. He has led more than 2 million Muslims to Christ. And he didn't do it by handing them a track. It's because of signs, wonders, and miracles. Even he is friends. I, he and I travel uh, a couple of times a year together. He is friends with the head imams of every Middle Eastern country. Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, and I have been with him when they've called him. I was in Iran when two of them called. He goes, oh, it's the imam of Pakistan. He goes, I'm like, <laughs> praying for him. And he's brother. And they call him the doctor of love. <laughs> because all he does is pray for them. And they, they, he says it's Jesus. They know it's Jesus. He's been loving the, the one imam, the head, of, uh, the head imam in Iraq. He has known for over 25 years. And the guy calls him every week to pray for him. And they said they, when, when he goes there, they put armed guards around him. They let him have events. Okay, you guys, he's just one guy. But two million Muslims now know Jesus. And the imams know Jesus too. They're just not saying. Okay. So there is mystery, there's anointing, and there's motivation. Write those three things down. Mystery, anointing, motivation. So God is mysterious, and healing cannot become a formula or even a technique of the way you pray. Because then you're putting God in a box, and God will blow you up so fast. He's also super fun. He likes to do things that are really, really weird and out of the box. You know, just, just when you think, this is the way I pray for people's backs to be healed. God will be like, I already healed them. You can be quiet. That's the kind of stuff he does. He doesn't want you to be dependent on formula. He wants you to be in love with him. Completely different. All right. You uh, do not have to convince God when you're praying about the worth of someone. Oh, my gosh. I wish I had a nickel for every time I ever heard this. Oh, God, you know, we're praying for Mary right now. And. Mary volunteers in the kids program every Sunday, and Mary feeds the poor on Wednesdays. You know, I'm like, what are you even talking about right now? <laughs> Mary's a child of God. She's not. It's not about works. It's about her heart. And you don't, don't, don't. There's nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say, "Oh, Father." You know, Peter's been a jerk, but that's okay because you know Peter last week he did this. this it is, there's nowhere that that stuff happens in scripture. So, so don't do that. Don't try to qualify people uh, for their righteousness. They have his righteousness, not their own. Okay. All right. So it's God's will to heal, period. But when some people don't get healed, you can ask God. He can take it. What happened there? Did I miss something? Did I miss a root of something? Teach me. Here's what I say. God, I don't know. Teach me, teach me, teach me. If I missed it, open my eyes, open my ears. If I went to a formula, forgive me. Teach me. Sometimes I don't know. But here's what I know about 2023. I had a, I had a crazy thing happen to me. I might preach tomorrow night on that. I might not. I don't know. But the Lord brought down an open vision of a scale about two months ago. And he said, you're going to have to learn to do this. You're going to have to learn to balance mystery and majesty. And I was like, what? And he goes, the way I'm about to increase, if you do not understand that I am both majesty and mystery, it's going to take you out. And I said, but I already know that, Lord. He goes, you don't know it in the way I'm about to move. So he showed me the scale and the base of the scale said, um, the base of the scale said righteousness and justice. The scale plates said mystery and majesty. The stem of it, the whole thing that held it up was Jesus, said Jesus. And the arms of the scales said Holy Spirit. And he said, the more you know me, the more you'll be able to balance this. So some of the crazy stuff we've been seeing lately, we've never seen before. Like God healing a whole, we, we had a woman healed of ALS. Gosh, I've been waiting for that for so long. In Brazil, one month ago, uh, a woman came in with a full stack of the equipment 
her lungs were already um, not able to expand. So if you've ever seen anyone in, in getting to the advanced stages of ALS, the, I could show you pictures. The oxygen tubes are this fat and they push the nose up and the mouth open. They're going in both nose and mouth this fat so that the lungs are forced to do some kind of expansions, otherwise they suffocate. So she's like this. This is not her church in Brazil, 4,000 people. She's also, her kidneys don't work and nothing works in her bladder. That's all like cement. She can't do any of that, urinating, defecating, none of that. So she's got that machine, the breathing machine. She's had a feeding tube in her abdomen for two years. She hasn't, drink, she hasn't anything to drink or eat. And one of our young guys, CJ from Australia, because our team's all over the world, he prayed for her. The anointing of God came in the room and he prayed for her and the power of God knocked her out and it freaked him out because she was so tubed up. She had all these tubes and wires and he tried to catch her and ended up going down on the ground with her and laid her out. She was out for like an hour and he just stood by her and he was praying and he was like, man, I don't know what's going on there. But like, he was afraid she died because like she was so sick and she hit the ground so hard with him and He's a big guy, but he like put his whole body kind of under her to catch her. But, you know, that's a lot of stuff to knock loose. Like he was like, oh, I hope she's all right. So he stayed there. She comes out of that thing and she, she is so different. The next morning when I'm preaching, I said, where's that woman? Where's that woman that, that had ALS? She's got all the stuff off. And she had a little tiny oxygen tube, just a teeny one like this because it was something attached uh, surgically, she had to get them to remove that. So she gives a testimony and she says, I woke up this morning and all I could think of was drinking coffee. And I was like, that's Jesus. She said, I had four cups of coffee and I ate breakfast. And she goes, and then I went to the bathroom. And she's like speaking Portuguese so fast. And I'm up there just like, ah. we're all crying. She, I have her back up on the platform that night. And she talks about how that day she drank coffee all day long. I'm not saying that's good. And then she ate three full meals. She went to the bathroom all day long. And the only thing she's got is a trace, this little tiny oxygen tube. And I'm telling you, you guys, I could show you on, on my phone or my iPad, the pictures of her so demonized and completely free. It looks like a completely different person. She looks 30 years younger. I mean, totally different. So that night I had her give the whole story. And she said that she had given, she was like the woman with the issue of blood. She'd given all her money to doctors. And she said this, God, if that, that American team is at the church, I'm going and I want you to do something because I can't live like that. I'm going to die. And when CJ went to pray for her and the power of God hit her and she was, she goes, I'm going to give all my money to the church because this is a whole lot more fun than <laughs> doctors. So she gives her testimony that night. And do you know, we saw 400 people healed. Every single person we prayed for because the, you've overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony, right? Her testimony was so insane. Mine is like that. 400 people get healed and our team is just, I mean, we are laughing our heads off. And I asked the Lord, what do you want us to do? And he goes, I want you to line all these people up. When he says line up 4,000 people, you're like, uh, somebody logistically fix this thing. And we did a joy tunnel. And do you know that she, she danced through that tunnel? She could not get, she could not walk when she came to that meeting. And so we're following up with her doctors. Her medical evidence is this high. She had 14 different diseases, but ALS was, yeah. yeah. When you think about that, you think about it's God's will to heal. I don't know why did it take that long. I don't know. Why did it take me 14 and a half years? I don't know. But if you can't hold the mystery and the majesty, you know, if you can't understand the mystery, you better get back in the word and get with the Lord by the power of the spirit and understand the overwhelming presence of his majesty. The more that overwhelms you, the more you'll be able to deal with the mystery. Because sometimes you'll pray your guts out. Sometimes you'll have a prophetic word about somebody's life and they die. Man, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why that happens. But sometimes you can't make sense of it. And you're going to have to be okay with that. Right? right? All right. So the anointing uh, in Luke 5.17, the word says the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal the sick. So sometimes in a place, depending on faith, depending on what God feels like doing at that time or what he's planning on doing at that time, or more likely the cooperation of the people he entrusted with the gospel, how we are participating with what the spirit wants to do, there's a greater anointing in some regions and some areas than at other times. 
Does that mean God won't heal the sick? No, because you can be walking down the street and you don't feel anointing at all, but you decide to step out in obedience and do it and he'll do it. But sometimes in rooms, in gatherings, you can sense a greater anointing than at other times. Okay. When there's no faith, sometimes there's a lesser anointing. We saw that Jesus in his hometown, he could only heal a few people because of their doubt. And we talked about that this morning in class. When you let the enemy intimidate you, then you have got doubt and fear leading you. You've got to let the intimacy in your intimate life with Jesus lead you all the time. And when intimidation comes, you just don't partner with it. Now, anointing is possible in greater measure because in Paul, uh, Paul states in 2 Timothy 4.20 that he saw handkerchiefs bringing healing to the, to the sick. But here's the rub. All right, here, here you go. Here's a little mystery for you. They left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Trophimus was one of the later apostles. They leave him sick in Miletus while Paul's handkerchiefs are healing people over here. What is the deal? I don't know, but that's weird. I mean, the atonement, pray, it, it paid for everything, right? So why was he sick in Miletus? I don't know. But these are things where you go, okay, why this? Why not that? Why, why this? Why is that? You can never, never stop praying with thanksgiving. Never. Because the enemy wants to trip you up and mess you up. And if you're looking for uh, the perfectness of understanding, good luck with that. I mean, welcome to Christianity. Come and die. And when you come and die, it doesn't mean you die to rationale or you, you die to theology. It means when something can't be added up and you keep asking, God, show me, show me, show me, show me in your word. You know, give me an experience. Let me know why, you know. He'll, he will do that in his mercy, but sometimes you can't, you can't make sense of it. Um, last uh, testimony about that. We, we had our team pray for a guy with stage four pancreatic cancer. And I had crazy prophetic words about this guy. One of these prophetic words went on for 45 minutes. When they first brought him into us, he had 104 fever and they brought him in on a stretcher. And they said he wouldn't live a week. Well, the power of God hit him. He got up. He didn't have a fever. And he went back home and started putting crown molding in his house. <laughs> totally normal. Went to the doctor and his pancreas, his numbers looked normal. And the doctor was like, what in the world is going on? And he was like, I feel great. Well, then I got a call. He's not doing great. Can we come back and see you? So the, the wife brought him back and he's now sick again. He's got a fever. Numbers are back up. And I pray for him and I say this to him, you know, all that abuse that happened to you when you were a young boy, if you don't forgive those people, this stuff is going to keep eating you. And he manifested demonically like he was going to rip my face off. Wow. You don't know what happened to me. And I was like, yeah, I do. Because I can see, it's like a ticker tape. I can see all the abuse. 14, 14 foster homes. I could see it. But here's what happened. Our, we lost one team member over this issue because she said that couldn't have been God that you prophesied his destiny and he died. I said, well, sweetie, it could be God because you don't know what happened behind closed doors. I met with that man and his wife four more times after that. I even went to pray over him an hour before he died. He would not forgive. He wouldn't. He said, I won't. And I found out how abusive he was to his kids and his wife. And when I went to pray over him, I prayed that he could leave this world in peace and truly be in the arms of his Savior. But our team, I didn't tell them all that because it's none of their business. Right. But we lost a young gal on our team. She was like, I can't make sense of that. I quit. I'm not going to pray for the sick. I was like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. So sometimes there's an explanation for that, and sometimes there isn't. Right. It's on the... On the trajectory of eternity, I asked God one day, show me how to make sense of this in my mind. It's so simple. My mind is simple. You're complex. I don't get it. I pray for this and this gets healed. I have a word of knowledge on this, this gets healed. I pray and pray and pray for this and it doesn't get healed. What is going on? And the Lord said, is it my will to heal? And I said, yes. He said, if you believe in me, do you live forever? I said, yes. He said, then on the trajectory of forever. I will heal you. I will heal everyone. That is not for you to question why. 
my position is everyone will be healed. You are to pray without ceasing with thanksgiving and watch me move. And when you don't understand, you can fall down on your face and cry, and I will comfort you. But on the trajectory of forever, I will heal everyone. So that's my theology. So I don't know. It helped me a lot. All right, motivation. So here's your motivation for praying. Your motive for healing people in Jesus' name has to always be, first and foremost, to honor the name of Jesus in the midst of unbelievers. 1 Peter 2.24. All right, never let the glory stick to you because literally it doesn't have anything to do with you. Mm-hmm. Everything that you and I do has to be motivated in, <clears throat> excuse me, and through love. And that love comes from intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And our goal is to see the whole earth filled with his glory. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 6, 3. All right. <clears throat> So people bring this up all the time. Well, what about Job? Like, what about Job? Did you read the end of the story? God let Satan do what he wanted. And then what happened? God restored to Job so much more than he, than he allowed to be taken from him. So in you, it, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when you exercise your faith, Christ's glory is manifested through healing and deliverance, miracles, signs, wonders, salvation. Okay? If you never exercise that, well, then you don't see much, and Christianity is pretty boring. All right. Is that good? If you love me, you will what? Obey. All right. So that is the ministry of reconciliation. So we often hear about the resurrection power of Jesus on the cross, and we hear about redemption, but we do not hear about reconciliation. So when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mountain, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If you look at the Hebrew and the Greek of that peacemakers, it's the reconcilers, the ones who bring the message of the gospel in power to reconcile the lost to God. So that's who you are. That's why you can't talk someone into the kingdom. It has to be demonstrated. Amen. All right. And his presence is manifest when we worship him. So everything starts from a position of that. So if you don't know what to do, just get on your face and worship. That's the best. Uh, I think that's probably enough. Are there any questions about that? Anybody? <laughs> well, let me answer anything, anything that's, that's like sticking like, like buggy. Anything that's buggy. Now, no. going once. Okay, so it comes, comes up. up just, just, yeah. yeah. So let me teach you uh, a model of praying for the sick, and then as soon as you learn it, you can throw it away. <laughs> it's not a waste of time for this reason. It will keep you from performance. It will also kill off your nervousness because most of you, how many of you are methodical thinkers? It'll really help you because if you don't have anywhere to land with your brain, you're going to be like, uh, I don't know what to do here. You feelers, you'll do it anyway because you'll see God move and then you'll be all about it. But the thinkers really need some place to land. Otherwise, you're like, I don't really get why this isn't happening this way. I'm going to teach you this five-step prayer model, and I will tell you, I know very well the person that wrote it, and they wrote it in a coffee shop on the back of a napkin because everyone said, how do you people pray? How come God moves when you pray? I don't know how to pray like that. So this was created by Blaine Cook and John Wimber in a coffee shop, and Blaine wrote it on the back of a napkin. Blaine and I traveled together for almost five years, and he told me the story, and I laughed my head off. I was like, and now everybody makes a theology out of it. He goes, it's so stupid, isn't it? I go. So we teach this in our school. We teach this and many other models. And then as soon as our students get it all, we say, just forget about it. Because there's only a one-step prayer model, and it's called, and he is called the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, once you get something in you and you're like, okay, I feel better. I'm not nervous. I can totally do it. Then you'll be able to go, oh, gosh, Lord, thanks. You just gave me the keys to a better car. I don't need five steps. It's one step. 
I'm just listening to you. But for nervousness sake, this will help. All right, so the intention of a prayer model is to provide a way to equip an ordinary believer to value, honor, and love the person they're praying for. Yikes, because we will make them a project so fast, just like evangelism. All right, so we are depending completely on the Holy Spirit in partnership. And the point, whether you're praying for physical healing, you're praying for emotional healing, or you're praying for spiritual freedom, the point is to minister wholeness to this person in love, in a straightforward, simple, and humble manner without religiousness, without weirdness, without a bunch of flash, loud yelling, demons aren't deaf. It's just conversation. Everything's a conversation. That's how Jesus rolled, and that's how we roll, all right? So charismatics, of which most of us are, or Pentecostal. So charismatics believe that healing is the demonstration of the restoration of the gifts given to the church, all right? So here's what they believe. I'm just telling you this because you'll run up against people from different walks of life and different religions, and this is their bent. So it's kind of good to know who believes what normally. So this is what they believe. Charismatics believe that lay people, people who are not clergy, pastors and prayer teams can engage in prayer for physical, emotional healing and deliverance from evil spirits. That's what charismatics believe. So you're pretty much game on with charismatics. You can pray. All right, but Pentecostals have a little bit of a different bent. Pentecostals, you're loving it, aren't you, Parker? <laughs> Pentecostals center healing on words of knowledge. They love words of knowledge. And if you don't have words of knowledge, they really kind of doubt you're serious about healing, <laughs> which is a mind blower to me because words of knowledge are great, but they're not everything. So if you don't get a word of knowledge in a Pentecostal situation, they'll be like, man, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so they center on words of knowledge and the preaching of the word and then the demonstration of power through assertive faith to release faith. All right, so what you hear in word of faith movements is you preach it till you believe it. You pray it till you believe it. And so a lot of times for those of us in charismatic camps, that's tough. I love their faith. But sometimes if the arm is broken and you just keep saying you need to have faith to believe the arm's not broken, I want to go, well, dude, the arm's broken. I don't know what to tell you. It's broken and I want to pray for the break to be healed. But I'm not going to deny that the arm is, is not broken. It's clearly hanging there, right? So there's just... Are you saying though, it's a word of faith mm. there like, no, you don't say it. No, you just don't say it. You don't, you don't address it. Gotcha. So if you're having a struggle... In Word of Faith camp, you got to preach it till you believe it. You got to pray it till you see it. You, you don't talk about that stuff. So I'm not, I'm not finding fault with anybody. I'm just telling you that, that these are the people that you will run into, and they'll come into this camp, and that will be their bent. And listen, you guys, Word of Faith camp, if you need some faith, those people are incredible. They'll believe with you for anything, which is phenomenal. We could all, I mean, seriously, we could use some of that. But I'm super logical, very linear, and so if you tell me that that's not a reality, but that is reality, there's a supernatural reality, and I get that, but I'm not going to say, okay, here's a great example. We've got a lot of people in the world right now suffering from anxiety and depression, so they will say, we're not going to address that. We're just going to keep praying, and I believe we keep praying, but there's a lot of people who are seriously suffering from anxiety and from depression. So I'm not going to ignore that and say it doesn't exist when it's clearly existing. Mm -hmm. I want to address it. So there's a fine line, right? We need that great faith they have. We need it. We need it. We need it. But denial, I don't know. Denial looks really noble on the outside while people are dying on the inside. That, that's kind of how I feel about that. But I'll, I'll leave that. Okay. So cessationists, not cessationalists. That's a completely different thing cessationists, you get that word, do not engage in the laying on of hands with the exception of the pastor because they believe, James 1.5, when you bring the people to the elders and the elders lay their hands on the, on the sick, the sick get well. So you can have a cessationist church where nobody believes in healing, but behind closed doors, those elders 
lay their hands on the sick and they really believe that they're healing people, but usually they're not. That, just saying. So <laughs> as dispensationalists, they believe God heals sovereignly without human assistance. So you'll hear them pray, God, if it be your will. God, if it be your will. Yeah, okay. So we'll go back to healing was central to the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 4, 23. Yeah, who's right? <laughs> well, I, you know, there's story after story. I will tell you, we, uh, we trained all of Francis Chan's churches and all his elders. It was a privilege and uh, a very humble thing that, uh, I mean, we were totally humbled what happened and blown away. We had a gal on our team, we still do, who's in that camp. She's a leader in Francis's camp. And she brought Lisa Chan to a meeting that I was doing in the Bay Area of San Francisco about seven years ago. And Lisa sat in the back of the church because it was packed out. And it was, how would you like to be the, the one who has to teach for three days to a bunch of cessationists, pastors and leaders from the Bay Area of San Francisco who don't believe in healing, but all came out of curiosity. I was like, Lord Jesus, if you don't show up, I'm just going to lay on the floor and cry. I can't. I can't. I don't know. <laughs> And I walked out on that platform literally shaken because the, the, the room was like, you know? and our team was on the front. Like, you can do it. They're all playing in tongues. <laughs> and they're like laying hands on each other, blowing each other up, falling in the eye. It didn't help. You know, like these people don't, don't like manifestations. And our team's like, ah, falling out. <laughs> all right. So here's what happens. I called some random person. Like I could, it was dark as pitch in the back of this. It's about 3,000 people. And about 10 rows back, I couldn't see anything after that. But there was somebody like three rows in, had a purple sweater on some woman. I remember I was like, you, because the Lord was like her. I was like, I don't know what you're going to do, but okay, I'm going because I have got nothing up here. I call her up <laughs> and I full on like get her, you know, her mail, like, you know, you got these kids and their names are blah, blah, and whatever. Blah, 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 and, you know, you got the shoulder pain and blah, blah. I mean, I was just like. I was, a, I was out of my mind because I was like, I cannot adopt that fear in the room. Like, I got to focus on Jesus. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually preaching the word of God and everything I'm saying is coming from the word over her. And then, the, and then I said, come Holy Spirit, just like that. And the Lord just banged into her, flattened her. And our teammate said, Lisa Chan went. Uh, she had never seen that. She had never seen the word taught exegetically correctly and then the manifestation of power of the Lord in her life. It was either some weird heretical doctrine and power, or there was correct exegesis and no power. She had never seen that. So she stood in a long line to come up and meet me, and I was praying for this Rwandan kid who had been in the genocide, and I refused to let him go. I, and I just told our people, get that line back there. I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm only going to, this is my assignment, this kid. He's ravaged by war, and I'm just going to sit here, and I did. I spent the rest of the time with him. So we ended up having the elders come to see me six months later when I'm back in San Francisco preaching to something else. They had prayed for a man that they believed that they had gotten saved. He came off the street because they do street ministry in San Francisco, and he, he was in their care. Then he disappeared. Then he came back, and then he went out, and he murdered somebody. Horrible story. This is, this is what led them out of Calvinism and into Jesus as healer. This man went and murdered somebody in such a horrific demonic way and they missed it. So they came to me asking me, why did that happen? We did what James 1.5 said. Because Lisa had told them, look, I want to meet her. I haven't met her. We're, you know, and, and I don't have anything you all don't have. So I'm just telling you what happens when you actually are scared to death in front of a bunch of cessationists and you just follow God. He shows up because he wants them to know him more than you can do anything, right? So these elders say, um, this guy did this. He's now in jail. We don't know what to do. And I said, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? And I looked at, and I, I only released what I, what I heard the Lord say. I said, well, he wasn't saved. You know that, right? And they said, ah, oh, that's what Francis said. And now Francis at this time doesn't realize how much he actually hears the Holy Spirit he wrote the book on the Holy Spirit, which is one of my favorite books on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I couldn't understand, like, what is the deal? He wrote the book about the Holy Spirit, but I don't know. So at this point, 
they are still arguing with me theologically. And I'm literally on a break in the middle of a conference. I'm on a 40 minute break and I don't have time to argue. So I looked at them and I was like, Holy Spirit, help me. I don't want to be disrespectful. I got 40 minutes. That's it. I'm not going to waste this arguing with them. And I, I just asked the Holy Spirit and he goes, he said, ask them if they believe that Christians can be oppressed by the demonic. So I asked them and they all said, no. Wow. I said, really? And then I said, Holy Spirit, help. And the Holy Spirit said, well, ask the head elder. By the way, he's saved out of the M, what's that, M13 gang? M oh, yeah. Yeah, M, yeah. And he has F you, like the words, on his eyelids. <laughs> and he keeps them there because it's conversation on the streets. I mean, literally. I mean, it's, he closes his eyes. I'm like, Rob. <laughs> anyway, so Rob, Rob is sitting there. Oh, classic Jesus. He manifests so bad, his upper lip starts shaking and sweating. And he goes, well, what do you mean? You're afraid of anything. What do you mean? And the guy, the el other elders are like. <laughs> and I'm like, and our team is behind them because they're getting delivered. They gave up their seats in the green room. And they're back there. <laughs> so he goes, he goes, well, I mean, I said, well, clearly you're upset. I said, do you want to talk about that? He goes, no, because no, no. He goes, I mean, knives. Yes, I am afraid of knives. And I was like, really? I said, like any knife? He goes, I mean, yes, because even when my wife is cooking, I can't be in the kitchen. I go, so I said, Rob, do you think that's normal? <laughs> and he goes, no, but if what happened to me happened to you, it'd be normal for you. Like, I mean, he's full on yelling, and all of the other elders are sitting there like, ooh. <laughs> They'd never seen this before. It's so, it's so what the Lord will do for you when you get in these, right. you get in these messes. And so he, I said, well, would you like to take care of that? He goes, and then he is a tear. He goes, yeah. And I go, okay, close your eyes. So he closed his eyes, lead him through this whole exchange deal. Turns out he was held at knife point right here and opened his throat. So one of the other gangbangers accused him of sleeping with his girlfriend, which he didn't do. He did a lot of really bad stuff, but he didn't do that. He was falsely accused by the guy. The guy cut his throat. And ever since then, because nobody stuck up for him, you know, his stuff goes way back, his father, blah, blah. Nobody stuck up for him. He carried that injustice right here just choked him and he could never see a knife without manifesting like he was going to choke to death. Wow. So as soon as he forgave the guy and Jesus exchanged the whole lie for the truth, he opens up his eyes and I look right at him and I said, spirit of torment, get out. And they all are looking at me like, did that just happen? And the thing goes. And then I said, so if I gave you a knife, what would happen? He goes, do you have a knife in here? I go, yes, we were just having communion before you came and there's a bread knife right there. And I said to our team member, give me that bread knife. It was one of those long serrated ones like this. And I go like this and I grab it. And he, he goes, he, he has his hands out like this. And he holds it and he starts to sob. And he goes, I have no, no fear. So that's what changed everything. And then we got invited to come in for the next two and a half years and over and over and over train their teams, train their, and we had these Holy Ghost parties with all of them doing healing. And now it is central to their ministry. And so they, many of their elders came to my house and uh, we had a closed meeting. And uh, I said, so you were reformers, you were Calvinists, now what are you? And they said, we're not that, because now we know, we know the truth. So whatever someone's doctrine is, for good or for bad, don't mark them by their doctrine, okay? They're children of God. Sometimes they've just never been shown and they've never been included to see that Jesus actually can meet them right, right where they are. And don't get into mindless arguments. You know, the, the word of God's clear on that. Don't, don't waste your time. All right. So your two scriptures, uh, the healing uh, ministry of Jesus in Matthew 4.23, which I've said several times. And then our mandate also in Mark 16, 15 through 18, going into the world, preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel doesn't mean just preaching. It means the word of God with the stuff. Mm -hmm. You do it all together. All right. In my name, they will what? Drive out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. They'll pick up snakes with their hands. All of that is you 
are, you have the enemy under your feet. That's the whole point of all of that. We are not into snake charming. That's in some other church somewhere. All right. Um, here's the five steps really quickly. This is what I'm giving you that you will learn and then forget. Okay, good deal. But learn it so that you can get over your nervousness. It'll help you, I promise you. All right, first uh, step is the interview. Not like a job interview. Okay, I'll explain. The interview, the second step is the diagnosis. You're not a doctor, it's just a word. Third is the prayer selection. <laughs> uh, number four, re-interview. Number five, post-prayer suggestions. That's pretty much how to keep your healing. All right, you ready? Okay, step one, the interview. Here's what we're doing. Make sure you get this organized in your head before you, in, and Friday night, you're all praying, so game on. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh. <laughs> Why do you think I showed up here without a prayer team? That's right, you didn't get those t-shirts for nothing. <laughs> yeah. Rick and, Jess, Rick and Jessica, Jesse and Parker, Vic and Shane, been around the block, they can all help, and I will help. We are here to empower you, that's the point. So if you won't do it, here, you're certainly not going to do it out there. This is your time to practice. Okay? So you like almost nod. <laughs> Maybe. Everyone's been like, oh, the spirit. <laughs> the spirit of the sovereign Lord. Boom. And then like this. I hope everyone else is praying for the sick. Okay. All right. So when when we open up the altar for ministry on Friday night, which is tomorrow night. People are going to come with a laundry list of crap because the, we live in a fallen world. All right. First of all, you do not have to listen to their story because if you listen to their story, it's, oh, dude, huh, huh. All right. Get your, but figure it out. Figure it out. Between now and tomorrow night, you got to figure this out. What are you going to say when somebody comes up and goes, I've been suffering for 35 years with debilitating Blah, blah, blah. And it started when my first husband left me for another woman. And then blah, 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 blah. And my father used to beat me. And then it's horrible stuff. By the time the person is done with the first two minutes, you have no faith to pray for them. And they certainly don't have any faith to be healed. You do not have to hear their story. Okay, let me show you how aggressive I am. I'm very loving. I'm very huggy, but I'm super direct. So, so stand up. What's your name? Caleb. Caleb. Nice to meet you. Okay, I'm going to just totally shut you down. So it'll be, it'll okay. be great. Okay, no, Caleb, okay. super nice to meet you. Okay, here's what I start with. Caleb, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Heal me. Okay, so that's such a great answer right there. All right, so what do you want Jesus to do for you? Not what am I going to do for you? I am not the answer to your prayer. Jesus is the answer to your prayer. What do you want Jesus to do? So here's what typically happens. Think of about five things that could be wrong with you. I know they're not. But let's say you walk up and I say, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Think of five things and just rattle them off really fast. Anxiety, back pain, depression, broken foot, headaches. Gosh, what a miserable life. No, no, <laughs> okay. I'm trying to think of something. So, and let's say out of those things, he starts to launch into, do you know I got in a car wreck when I was five? And then that's what started it. And that was the foot pain. And then when I was 15, blah, blah, and this and that. And here's what I say really lovingly. I usually put my hand right on him and I go, hey, I'm really sorry for what happened to you, all that stuff. But I don't need to hear the story. And if I stop and let you tell me the whole story, I'm going to run out of time to pray. So, although all that is very important, it's not necessary, and I really want to see Jesus heal you. Don't you want that? That's how I do yes. it. <laughs> all right? So, that good. <laughs> that's my practice speech. But before I didn't have a speech, people would come up and they would vomit on me, and I'd be like, I just want to run screaming out of this room right now. I have no faith to pray for any of you. I don't. I could not figure it out. Well, my friend Michelle is way more direct even than me. I don't know how she gets away with this. I tried it once, and the woman was so insulted she just left. She does this. 
I'm going to stop you right there. I mean, she literally, <laughs> she just does it like right up in their face. She goes, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm just going to pray for you. And somehow they shut up and listen. They don't do that for me. But I always say, I, I, I cannot hear that story. I have to pray for you. God's going to do something. Don't you want that? that that's my thing. So thank you, Caleb. Um, whatever your thing is, get it between now and tomorrow night because there, all right, figure out your personality. Like you super direct like me. I mean, I don't recommend the hand in the face thing, but some of you are nice people and it might work. I don't know. Michelle gets away with it all the time. She still does to this day. I, I'm, just, I'm like, why is that possible for you? Nobody gets insulted. So we have some people that say, hey, look, if you tell me that story, it's I'm going to lose my faith and you don't have any. You need my faith right now. <laughs> Some people say that. I mean, our team has all kinds of ways of doing it. And they some people just go, Shh. <laughs> I <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it worry doesn't need a man a few words. He, he, you know, they go Shh. And they don't know what to do. They're like, what? Are you shushing me? I'm going to pray for you right now. And then, then they stop. So I don't know what it is you need to do, but you need to figure it out because <laughs> they will come up and they, you will lose everything. And then you'll be like, I don't want to do a healing ministry. <laughs> I'm out. I'm leaving. So figure that out. All right. Okay. So what do you want Jesus to do for you is the first part of the interview, but ask their name. Could you ask their name? Because otherwise they're just a person. It's very important to address people as people and not projects. All right. So I also sometimes feel the need, especially when there's abuse. I get an impression, a word of knowledge that there's abuse. I say this, whatever happens between us and the Holy Spirit stays here. I'm never going to talk about you or what happened here. If you want to talk about you, that's your story to tell. But you are safe. This is confidential. I don't say that with every person, but sometimes I feel the need to say that with whatever's about to unfold. Okay. Um, ask the person what they want Jesus to do. And we're talking about physical healing here. I'll, I'll talk about in, um, emotional healing uh, in a minute. But don't let them go into the great detail, but you would like to say, what is it? All right, so when Caleb was saying, you know, this, that, and the other thing, if somebody just gave you a list of like five things like he did, you could easily say, if Jesus could do one thing for you tonight, what's the one thing? Get them to own it because their will is involved in the healing process. Okay, free will, free will does that. All right, so, uh, okay, this has to be said. Not insulting anyone in this room because it happens when you're nervous. Have you ever been in a room with somebody where they start to tell a story and you go, yeah, that happened to me. And then you start on your thing, then they go, yeah, that happened to me and this. And then you go, yeah, that happened to me. <laughs> this is not the time for you to go, that happened to me. We're not trying to share horror stories, okay? So we don't do that happened to me at all. That does not apply. <laughs> In healing ministry, you don't need that level of empathetic connection because empathy is powerless. Compassion is powerful. Empathy is powerless. Right. Okay. Um, don't grill them with 20 questions. It is not a job interview. You don't need 20 questions. You just need to know what is Jesus, what do you want Jesus to do for you? What's the main area of focus? And uh, again, if they're trying to keep on telling you their whole life story, bring them back to the point. If they start again. Oh, Hang on, you said you wanted Jesus to heal us. I don't need to hear that. Let's go, right? You might have to redirect. No, no, I don't. No, I don't need to hear that. Okay, so let me, let me give you some examples. So what's your name when they walk up? It puts them at ease. Hey, I'm Joe. What's your name? You know, it's just a conversation, right? Some people never have had healing prayer, and a lot of people get drug up there by their spouse, parents, grandparents, and they're up there like deer in the headlights. Like, I don't even know who God is. My grandmother brought me to this meeting. You know, just put them at ease. Like, you're not some freak show, you know, just be nice. What would you like prayer for? What do you want Jesus to do for you? Okay, here, number three, how long have you had this? That's important. How long have you had this? And 
do you know what caused it? Sometimes I don't say, do you know what caused it? I say, was anything significant happening in your life when that happened to you? Another helpful question. Again, you don't have to ask all these. Just be dependent on the Holy Spirit. Do you have a doctor's diagnosis? Sometimes good to know. Or what does the doctor say? So if you ask that question, was anything specific going on in your life when this condition or illness started, is a key. Because uh, I could tell you, I could tell you 100,000 stories of keys that got dropped in that moment. Uh, we had a woman with uh, also uh, advanced stages of cancer. Um, by the way, we've seen the Lord heal thousands and thousands of cases of cancer, but late stage cancer, like you have a week to two weeks to a month to live, we've seen the Lord heal 57 people. And that, I mean, deathbed stuff where full on cancer metastasize in the bones and then boom, cat scans, yeah. pet scans are clear. I mean, that's Jesus, you know, thank you, God. So when you ask them, uh, was there anything specific going on in their life? Uh, we had this woman, late stage cancer on oxygen, the whole deal. And when I said, was anything significant going on, she began to manifest demonically. And she started talking about her daughter. And I said, uh, I heard the Lord say, she's not going to forgive her daughter. And I said, well, word of knowledge, uh, whatever your daughter did to you, uh, this is directly, I said, what your daughter did to you happened in June, didn't it? And she looked at me like, she said, yes. And then she said, I'm never going to forgive her, which, you know, you're like, oh, here we go. And I said, and this cancer came in August. She said, yes. Yeah. Perfectly healthy woman. She's actually a psychologist. Um, the judgment and bitterness against her daughter was an open wound in her soul. And not, I'm not saying that equates this every time. I'm just saying in her case, that was directly related to that incident of her saying, I'll never forgive you to her daughter, cursing her daughter, judging her daughter. And I could go into another time when I come, uh, bitter root expectancies and bitter root judgments operate on the same scale. What you reap, you sow. Mm -hmm. Judge not, lest you be judged. When you have an expectation, everyone will reject you. Guess what? You live a life of rejection right. because it's right. like a boomerang. Mm -hmm. So it's biblical, uh, I, and, and I don't have time to teach that tonight, but just know that. It, it does what you, are, what you are sowing, you are reaping. Absolutely. So... Um, if the person doesn't know what the cause is, they've just had this, then you, you just can ask Holy Spirit if you need to ask any more questions. But sometimes I get an impression, or our team does, because we do so much trauma work, PTSD, stuff like that. So a lot of times trauma is at the root of something. So you can ask if you are learning, which you are, um, did you have any traumatic event related to uh, the onset of this? Um, a man who was struggling with migraines from the time uh, he was 23, they came on on set after his wife of only two years left him for another man. Wow. So he felt that sh she left him betrayal. So betrayal was the catalyst for the migraine headache. You know, it's not always that easy, but, but sometimes. Um, you may, if, if people want to know, like, right then why that relates to that. Maybe you could just pray and then explain to them later because usually the power of God will hit them and they won't care after that. <laughs> but a lot of people are trying to derail the praying uh, because there's a demonic uh, influence there that wants to keep you from praying. So don't get sucked into that. They'll keep you talking and not praying. Yeah. Also, spirit of religion does that. Let's talk about the theology of that. How about let's not? Let's just pray. <laughs> talk about theology after you get healed okay so that's enough for the initial interview and uh, remember that the will of the person is sometimes a factor not always sometimes we can go up to somebody on the street with a word of knowledge and pray for them they don't know Jesus their will's not bent towards Jesus and God heals them again mystery majesty but to the to man, remember, remember when Jesus walked up to the man at the pool of Bethesda and he said, do you want to get well? Dude, come on. You can say the angel stirs the waters and I can't get in there for 30 years. Do you really want to be healed? 
do you want that? Sometimes to get their will, you know, because some people come loaded with junk and they really just want to complain to you. They don't really want to be healed because it's their identity. Okay. Uh, he even asked blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, it's obvious. He's blind. But he asked him. Okay. Um, word of knowledge, prophetic word is often a key we learned this morning. Those words of knowledge are the absolute promise God's about to move. So you want to press in for those words of knowledge. They are impressions about what God wants to do. Like you might all of a sudden think ankles. Why am I thinking about ankles? Well, because God wants to heal someone's ankle. Or you might get a picture of a heart and it might look like a cartoon heart. And you might be like, why is that coming across my brain? Well, because either somebody has heart issues in the physical or somebody emotionally is struggling in their heart. So pay attention to those nudges from Holy Spirit, seeing it, dreaming it, feeling it, sensations in your body that last up to 90 seconds that aren't really yours, those pains in those areas. One time I got pain in my, these two fingers, I was like, and I normally don't get the physical because I suffered physically for 15 years. So God's got mercy on me. I mostly think them. But I went into a bathroom stall and I was like, man, I don't have any words of knowledge. That's weird. And then all of a sudden I felt like I slammed my fingers in the door. I was like, did I slam my fingers in the door? Because I never get physical. And I went out there. I was like, that's so weird. And I said, I don't know. I think somebody slammed their these two fingers in the car door. That's what it felt like. And the guy in the sound booth in Brazil, way up at the top of this huge church, he goes like this. <laughs> and I can see him. I'm like, dude, how great. And he comes down the ladder. And before he hits the bottom of the ladder, he's healed. His fingers were smashed to death, broken bones, everything. God just completely healed him. So pay attention to those weird little things because they are keys. All right. The last thing is when you are talking to this person, if they are in physical pain, if 10 is the worst pain, zero is no pain, make them rate their pain. Here's why. Somebody like me, before I got healed, I had been walking in chronic nerve pain for almost 15 years. And if pain is still present, even if it's going down, I'm going to say to you, I'm still in pain. Unless you give me a scale, I was in level 10 pain all the time. If 12 was on the scale, I was in that. So as I was being prayed for and my pain started to lessen, I started to notice because he gave me a scale. Oh, it's now eight. Oh, it's seven. It's six. It builds faith in the person. If you don't do a scale, here's what they'll say. Someone's suffering for years, they'll go, I'm still in pain. And then you don't have any faith to pray anymore and they have no faith anyway. So use the scale. It'll be helpful. All right. Uh, the other thing, I don't really use, do this anymore, but sometimes uh, our team still does. What kind of pain is it? Is it stabbing? Is it fiery? Is it Because when it shifts, um, they will notice that if you ask them that question. You don't have to, but sometimes it's interesting. If the pain starts moving around their body, it's demonic. Often people will explain it like it's a snake. They'll say, wow, it was in my hip, but then it just went, ooh, yuck, it went up my back. Because that's exactly what it is. And once it starts to move, you should be excited. Because that means it's going. Because they never move unless they're exposed. So, yeah. Randy Clark always says, if you spot them, you got them. Which cracks me up. <laughs> Give the person permission to interrupt you only if the pain's moving, not to tell you their story. Okay? All right. Flying through this now. Diagnosis. That's not a medical diagnosis, but this is pretty much you determining how you're going to pray. So you are answering this question with the Holy Spirit. What is the root cause of this sickness or infirmity? That's you going, Holy Spirit, I got nothing. What is the root issue of this? Because if you go after the root, the healing comes like that. And then the sickness isn't going to come back. But just taking a stab and praying for the symptom, sometimes it'll work. But wouldn't you rather get to the mother load and get rid of it and be done? I mean, I'm a bottom liner all the time. Like, I would rather wait a minute, take a breath, listen to the Lord, and go after the thing at the root rather than waste an hour praying for somebody. If it's Because it won't stay away anyway. Because its rights haven't been revoked, especially if there's a demonic thing there. All right. So um, from that, 
You get an in, you might get an inkling, you might get an impression, oh, I'm gonna start over here. Just start somewhere. And if you aren't sure, that's okay, because you are you are working with Holy Spirit. You're gonna learn the language he has just for you, right? And that's how you do it. You pray by this, and then you're gonna learn the way he speaks to you. I have a lot of imagery, and I know when I see certain images, oh, it means that, it means that, it means that, it means that, I've just learned. And, and he'll do the same for you. He'll give you your own language so that it's faster for you. Okay, once you have that, that's a pretty quick, quick step. You're going to step three, which is the prayer selection after that. So possible roots that you may have been impressed by the Holy Spirit are an afflicting spirit, okay, like I was explaining to you earlier. Those afflicting spirits get attached to people. You can't be possessed if you, if you have given your life to Christ. You can be oppressed, not possessed. Okay, does everybody know that? You belong to the Lord, so the demonic can't own you. That's what that means. But an afflicting spirit can oppress you and have a right to be there for unforgiveness, judgment, anger, rejection, unbelief, or other wrong thinking. Now, if you have been abused as a child, there can be a spirit there of rejection, abandonment. There can be an afflicting spirit because somebody, somebody assaulted you and took away your voice. And sometimes all we need to do is stand with that person, let that memory be reinterpreted with Jesus, and say, looking in their eyes, it was never your fault. You didn't do anything. You were a child. This was wrong. And for them to be able to express as an adult while viewing what happened to them and say, it wasn't my fault. I'm choosing to forgive this person, right? Forgiveness, first and foremost, means this. There is an offense that has been committed against you. There is a debt that is owed. That's what forgiveness really means in the Hebrew. Most people don't want to forgive because they don't think God is a God of justice because it happened to them. But if God revokes free will of the abuser, he has to revoke the free will of all. That's why it's so heinous trying to navigate around childhood abuse. But when the memory is reinterpreted with Jesus, they understand they were violated, but they choose as an adult to forgive this person, verbalizing what you did to me was wrong, you owe me, but I'm going to choose to release that debt to Jesus. These words for someone who's been abused sexually or physically or verbally as a child, it restores back their life, gives them back their dignity, and breaks the power of rejection. And that is sometimes enough. The physical manifestation of healing just happens. Done deal. Okay, so that those root issues are definite anchors, and you're looking for that. Um, let me give you some, some things. I, I think you'll, this will interest you. So stomach or bowel issues, not 100%, but most of the time. Those are related to insecurity, rejection, and abandonment. Yeah. It's basically a spirit of fear and worry, and it manifests in the bowels. Not always, not 100%, okay? So we don't accuse people, ah, well, you have this. But ask the Lord, and, and he'll tell you. Um, a lot of times people with back pain have a serious issue with unforgiveness. Unforgiveness towards self or towards someone else. So think about what the body does. So if I'm standing up straight, what is my back doing? My back is supporting me, right? So... With unforgiveness, that person was not supported wow. and it manifests in their back. Wow. Weird, right? Oftentimes, when somebody was kept from doing something in their uh, childhood or they were kept from doing something in their job, all of a sudden they start having leg pain, knee pain, hip malfunction. So these things, your hips, your knees, your ankles, your feet, they move you forward, don't they? So somebody who's prevented from getting a promotion or somebody who was prevented, like maybe they thought their sibling was favored over them. They didn't get their college paid for this or that. All of a sudden they develop stuff in their lower extremities, physical manifestations, because they were prevented from moving forward. That's what their legs do. Okay. Um, judging against oneself, self-judgment, self-criticism, unforgiveness towards self often manifests uh, 
with autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. It's your own system attacking itself because you attack yourself with your thoughts. Yeah, I could go on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Yeah, that also is self-judgment, self-criticism. Okay, it's also uh, the big one. When, when you have a, a fear of man, and it's a really strong fear of man, a lot of people develop migraines. So I will tell you the percentage of worship leaders in our country in cessationist churches who suffer migraines is unbelievable because I know so many of them. And they call our ministry they, because they don't want to tell anybody. And I always ask, when did this start? It's the moment they became the worship leader of that church. You know why? Because everyone's condemning them. Why are they wearing those knit caps? Why do they have all those jeans on? Why do they have skinny jeans? Why do they have this? Why do they have that? Why are they playing that song again? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and it's criticism, criticism, criticism. And they're afraid of disappointing the pastors and the people. And so they start to develop this criticism about themselves. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, let me finish this. And then if we have time, I'll go back to, like, I have... 100 pages of, of this. <laughs> They're super funny. I mean, not funny, but like crazy. You're like, wow. And then when you see it, you go, that is nuts right there. Okay. Um, let's see. So we can have sickness of the soul, right? Because when you, there are people who came out of such brokenness in their life and they never had anybody love them. Like just put, coming out of the prison, we were ministering in a prison a couple of days ago in Texas. And 100% of those men, 300 men that we, a hard, hardcore, most of them are in there for 99 years. I mean, hardcore. Um, they never had anybody love them. So if you think about how they think about themselves and the demons that are in there, it's nuts because nobody ever loved them. And the power that changed the world is love. So we, we have to look at what is the ruling spirit over that person. And not every sickness has a demon, but psh, a whole bunch of them do. Um, I've seen men and women who lose their job, they have a prominent job, and all of a sudden they're layoffs or they're outsourced, develop migraines like that. Because suddenly their worth, which was in their position, is no longer there, so who are they? All that self-doubt, and they have nowhere to land. Um, so the, here's another real, real issue. Let's say <clears throat> I'll use a woman, um, uh, in Europe, was in a wheelchair, MS in the back of the room and our whole team, we had, I think 27 or eight of our team there. They all prayed for her. Every, every one of them. I was up in the front leading. I didn't pray for her. And then the Lord said, put the microphone down. Uh, worship's going on right now. Go back and pray for her. I go, man, Lord, 28 people already prayed for her. I don't want to pray for her. He goes, go back there. I was like, yes, sir. Okay. I go back there and I'm thinking, I got nothing. They already all prayed for you. Like, I look right at her and here's what dropped into my spirit. You are defined by what your husband says. And I'm going to pray for you and you're going to get healed and you're going to get out of that chair. Like, I literally said that. I was like, are you kidding me right now? I just said that. Like, what is going on? She's been in this chair for five years. The Lord said, you're going to get out of that chair. I said, you're going to get out of that chair. But as long as you let the words and criticisms of your husband define you, you'll be right back in that chair by tomorrow. Is that what you want? And I thought, gosh, I sound like that. It was loving, but it was like, Pfft. she just sat there and the power of God hit her. She starts shaking. I go, come on, let's go. Here's my arm. Get up and walk in Jesus' name. Wow. And two of our team are standing there like, <laughs> I started laughing. There's video of this. It's so nuts. She puts both hands on me, on my arm, and she gets up. Wow. And we walk around that church, and it's like, you know, the it's so, just so amazing of Jesus. It's like the Red Sea, you know, people parting. We're just walking around the church, walking around the church. Music's going, and I said, play some, play some earth, wind, and fire. Play celebration or some, you know, someone. And of course, it was a London like gig band, you know, and that art, they're 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 doing worship, but they play in the clubs in London, so they can play anything. So they're celebrate good times, come on. And she's looking at me, the woman. I go, come on, let's go. We start walking around because Jesus isn't religious. This woman got completely healed that night, but what she really got healed was the abuse. Right. 
from her husband. So she had to go through the forgiveness thing. But listen, you guys, you could have 28 people pray for somebody and it's not me. It's God. He wanted to do something that was so unique and different. And that was not, I mean, I don't normally have celebrate praying and I don't normally, you know, do all of these things. So um, someone gets identified in the chair. They've been in the chair. That becomes their identity. So when you're trying to unwind somebody in healing and their identity by their family is affirmed each day as being an invalid or a sick person, it's very hard for them to maintain their healing. I see them lose it all the time. They'll be completely free. And then they go back home where they're known as that person who can't work. And everyone speaks to them that way. When I was healed, I went back home. My husband was dumbfounded. We were all dumbfounded. But he must have asked me every day, about 15 times a day, how's your pain level? After day two, I looked at him and I go, don't ever ask me that again. I don't ever want to hear those words out of your mouth again. I love you with all my heart. Don't and he's very kind. He was trying to, that's what he did for 15 years. Asked me what my pain level was so he could rate how much help I needed. And when he asked me that, I was like, it was like searing in my brain of that was old language that belongs in the pit of hell. We're not doing that anymore. So if the people around them are not trained to speak in a new way, then, then it's very hard to get free. And, and Bill Johnson has often said this, and Randy Clark and I have talked about it too, if the person is still living in a dysfunctional household where they're treated as an invalid, it's pretty impossible for them to stay healed. And after a while, they keep coming to these meetings. And if you keep seeing that person and they can't stay healed, then just bless them and don't keep doing this. Up, down, up, down. It's, it's heartbreaking. And you can explain to them, but it's their choice. You know, they, they could get a job and they could move out. Mm-hmm. but some people won't all right a spiritual cause real quick a spiritual cause that somebody might have for being sick uh they might have gone to a psychic they've never repented of that can open all kinds of fun doors um i can't get into uh all the masonic stuff tonight <clears throat> freemasonry because that's just a whole day in itself but freemasonry are covenants and oaths that have been taken in family lines um, do you guys have that prayer? Okay. Well, if you need it, you can let me know. Well, if you, if you need it, I'll just send it to you. Just let me know. So when people, when people's ancestors have made covenants with the demonic in the dark and those covenants go from generation to generation and you suddenly see things like no female in the family, uh, can carry, can get pregnant. They're all infertile or there's a bazillion miscarriages, or there's a lot of problems in the throat and in the stomach in women, you can guarantee it's Freemasonry. And you ask, does anyone else in your family have this? And yeah, my mom, my aunt, my, all my sisters, my, there's something going on there. So breaking covenants by the blood of Jesus uh, also is something to consider, but we don't need to go into all of that uh, tonight. All right, so praying for the person led by the Holy Spirit, you're selecting prayer, how you're going to do it. So I don't recommend petitioning style prayer, which is, Father, in the name of Jesus, if you be your will, would you restore hearing to so-and-so? Because it's not modeled in the Bible. You don't see that. You you know, but some people are, when they first start out, they're just more comfortable doing that because they're nice. I've never prayed like that because I'm not nice, but uh, like, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, bring alignment to these feet. That's so gentle and kind. I mean, it works, but it's not really how Jesus prayed. But uh, you you never do if it be your will, just because it is God's will, right? Faith gets robbed from you and the person when you use that language, so, so don't. So when you're doing commanding prayer, if you're in a cessationist church, they'll tell you if you pray commanding style prayers, that you're trying to boss God. That's not true. You are actually speaking to the physical body or the emotional position of the person or the spiritual thing in the person and commanding that in the name of Jesus to do something. You are not commanding God to do anything. You're simply drawing on the atonement that Christ paid for. Okay. All right. So your all authority, power, and identity is in Christ. Uh, write these two scriptures down, don't have time to go into them, but Philippians 2, 9 through 11, 
This is that God has raised Jesus up to the heights of heaven, name above all names. And Luke 9, 1 and 2, uh, Jesus gives the authority and power to the 12 to drive out the demons and cure all diseases and to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. All right, let me go through this. What I did not go through this morning, exousia is the Greek word for authority, right? Dunamis is the Greek word for power. Same root word as dynamite. So if you understand power and authority, you understand which thing you're drawing on the atonement for. When there is demonic activity, it is always 100% the authority of Christ that removes the demonic power from a person's life. But when you are praying for the sick, it is the power of the cross that creates things that aren't there. You could see limbs grow, blind eyes open. That's the power of Jesus. Now, if you have an, uh, an affliction in the body and it's a spirit and the body needs healing, then you'll see authority and power. So I told the crew this morning, look at the book of Mark. If you want to learn about authority and power, go through that as a Bible study on your own and look at every time Jesus healed someone and every time he delivered them. And you'll see the difference very quickly about authority and power. Okay. Um, so let me say this. Gosh, there's so much. I'm just trying to get through this. Healing is the removal of something through authority. Okay. Healing is the removal of something through authority, while miracles are the creating of something through power. Let me say it again. Healing is the removal of something through authority, while miracles are the creating of something through power. What do I mean by that? So a true miracle is something that is not possible for man to do. That's the nature of a miracle. That happens through power. But healings are usually associated with some type of oppression of the enemy. So that's going to come through authority. Does that make sense? So we say all healings are miracles because Jesus is a miracle worker. But it's not the same thing. When you're talking about a recreated body part, you're talking about ears that don't even have all the parts to hear and all of a sudden a person can hear, that comes through power. But when we're removing the demonic and someone gets healed, that is authority. All right. Um, a commanding prayer is always appropriate unless the Holy Spirit interjects with something else. And he will, if you let him. Um, Let's see. This is not a rule. This is a suggestion. Don't do deliverance on unsaved people. Unless God says so. Now, he's, he's told us that. He sent us on assignment to somebody, fully demonized and unsaved, and said, do deliverance. But I don't do that, and our team will not do that unless God says so. Uh, I did that with my own father. I led my father through deliverance. He wasn't saved. But I fasted for a week, and I went there, and I was like, Send me to Mozambique with the lepers. I'd rather go there than my dad's. You know, I didn't want to go. But I saw what God did through the manifestation of, of the authority to remove the demonic. My dad was like, what in the world just happened to me? He got healed of back pain, thrombosis, heart. It was nuts. He gave his life to God like that. I mean, like he, I said, dad, I don't, I'm not going to talk you into this. I'm not going to coerce you. Nothing. What just happened to you was Jesus Christ. And he, be, he was bawling. And he goes, I want that. I want that. Because I was like, when I leave, all that stuff's going to come back because you don't know the Lord. And I said, but do what you want. I don't care. Uh, I mean, just don't do it because Matthew 12, 43 40 through 45 says, when you cast a demon out of a person in the power of Jesus, it roams around the region, right? Yeah. Looking to come back, it'll bring seven worse and you'll leave them, you'll leave them ruined. But if God says it, like he said to my dad, then you do it. But otherwise, we don't. Uh, and I wish I could get into the whole teaching of why deliverance belongs to the saved. But I don't have time right now. Okay. When you're speaking to the body, you can say, in the name of Jesus, spine align, be healed. You know, if you're talking to the back. Speak to the thing that isn't working and tell it to work according to the, the heavenly kingdom and according to the power of Jesus. All right? Um. If you are doing deliverance, which I guess you guys have people coming to teach you that, you do that with your eyes open, right? 
And, and I, I, please keep your eyes open. I always have everybody keep their eyes open. Um, but I'm talking about the preyee, the person, if you're leading them in inner healing, emotional healing, they can shut their eyes because normally it's a position of an exchange, a holy exchange of their, whatever harmed them, they give back to Jesus and they can imagine with their eyes closed what Jesus would say and do. But when it comes to deliverance, man, you look right at their eyes because those demons can see fire of, of Jesus in your eyes and then you tell them to go. So when you're praying for physical healing, they can have eyes open, eyes closed. You always have your eyes open as the person who prays, but it's helpful. All right. Um, again, unforgiveness, major obstacle to healing. And unforgiveness of self is the thing people keep really hidden uh, deep down. So be compassionate. Never uh, accuse somebody of having sin be the cause of their affliction, even though it might be. People used to come up to me. My husband and I tried a Pentecostal church when I was afflicted, and we laid on, I laid on the floor. I couldn't sit. And I wanted to be in church because I just wanted to be around worship. And we went to 27 churches, no joke, when we moved to California, Northern California. And I laid on the floor in this one church, and I had four people from the church walk by and say, I, I had unconfessed sin, and that's why I was afflicted. They didn't even know me. And I was like, I can't get out of this church fast enough. So there are people that have been raised with a doctrine uh, that will be so offensive. So let's not be those people, okay? Um, let's go to now we are praying, okay? Um, listen to the Holy Spirit. Learn to do this while you're, while you're speaking. Learn, learn to hear him and impressions. He might give you something that'll just be the, the, the thing that just unlocks all of it. Um, you cannot thank the Lord enough. Can I tell you? Thank him and thank him and thank him. And it's great to pray in teams. It's so much better because where two of you are there, when one of you falters, the other one's got it. And I, I love our team because one of us will be praying, the other one's thanking God the whole time. It's, it's so great. It's, I don't know. It, just keep the prayers and the commands short. Do not pray a litany list of stuff. And again, if they had five things wrong with them, what's the one thing? If you have time, you can tackle another, but don't mix them up. Like if they had back pain and a shoulder pain, don't start with the back, go to the shoulder because you lost your faith. I've seen people do that. <laughs> Stick. I've done it. Stick with the one thing, okay, and, and see that through, all right? Then you're going back to this interviewing, okay? We're in the fourth. Uh, are you better? Did you feel anything? I just say this. What's going on? Talk to me. What's happening? Uh, and they might say nothing. Uh, I had given them the pain scale. It, you said when we started, your pain was eight. Is it still that? Oh, no. Gosh, it's like a six, you know? Um, did you feel anything? Try moving your body. Try something you couldn't do. You want the people to exercise faith in that moment, okay? Um, if uh, there is no manifestation of change, you don't stop praying until... They don't want you to pray. You've run out of things to pray. Our Holy Spirit tells you to stop. Because we've prayed for somebody 23 times and they got healed. I don't know. We prayed for somebody one time and they get healed. I don't, I don't know. But you're not to stop unless those three things are happening. You don't, you, you're done. Holy Spirit says you're done. Or the person's like, I, I'm done. But I don't know. That rarely happens. The Lord just shows up. Um. Use your normal tone of voice. I don't know what that is that we just, when the demons start manifesting, we're like, you, get out, in Jesus' name. All right, don't pray in tongues unless you're trying to edify yourself. Praying in tongues over somebody does nothing for healing. And there are some camps where they do that. I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. So in the Bible, you need interpretation of tongues in order for that to be effective. Otherwise, you're edifying yourself, which could be good if you're praying in teams and you're like, man, I'm tapped out. I, I'm like, turn around and pray in tongues and let your partner take over praying if you need to do that. But praying in tongues over somebody, unless the Lord directs that, is, is really, it's for you. It's not for their benefit. Um, everything's done in love because if you don't have that, we don't have anything. Um, if you're not getting anywhere, ask this. Try to remember if there's anything significant that happened to you during that time. 
you just could ask one more time if anything significant happened. If no, uh, ask the question, does anybody else in your family have this condition? Then you might know that it's a covenant thing and something's going from generation to generation. Um, have you ever been to a psychic? Have you ever been involved in witchcraft? Lots and lots and lots of people have been involved in witchcraft, especially in the charismatic church. <laughs> Let me quantify that statement. Yes, I mean, here's why. They grew up in religions where it was powerless, powerless gospel, and they're very prophetic people, usually. And they never saw any power, so they drifted over into the New Age world that got them into Wiccan, and then they came back around realizing that wasn't the way, came back into a charismatic church where they saw power, but they never cleaned up all that junk back there. So my friend Rodney Hogue says, it's like your soul is a town. And the light of Jesus hits the town, but with some of us, we got some bars and some brothels on the backside where we're still in the dark, and the Lord needs to address that, right? It's like whatever Jesus paid for, we want to make sure the light of, of Jesus affects those places, all right? Um, step five, you're, once the person is free or as free as it is going to happen in this moment, um, encourage their walk with the Lord. Maybe God's going to give you some scriptures to, uh, to back them up, to help them pray. Uh, if somebody had struggled with depression, I will often say, go in the Bible and look, out, look up everything the Lord has to say about joy. Because joy is not happiness. Joy is actually the power of Jesus manifest in your heart and in your mind. Does that make sense? Um, all right. When you are praying deliverance, as opposed to praying physical healing um, or inner healing, you really, you do not do deliverance by yourself. It's just silly. Mm -hmm. uh, because demons are liars and you get really tripped up and you get exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, it's better to do it in a team and only one person talks and only one person ever touches the person. Keep it orderly because demons like to confuse everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure <laughs> if the person goes out, a lot of times the demonic will cause them to go unconscious, eyes shut, buzzing in the ears, suddenly they can't see you, hear you, anything like that. We don't allow uh, the demons to manifest. We just tell them, we call the person's name. That's why you need to make sure you know the person. Call their name until they come back. You call their name in a really nice voice and pretty soon they'll open their eyes and look at you like they don't even know where they've been. And you talk to that person. And if the demons try to talk to you, they try to manifest, you say, no, in the name of Jesus, I forbid you from manifesting. And I usually tell the demonic, when it's time to go, you're going out quietly. You're not going to, because they love to cause disruption. But you don't need to have any of that happen. We rarely have demonic manifestations uh, anymore. But in the beginning, pfft, People would fall off couches and slither on the floor, and we'd be like, what in the world is that? We had no idea what we were doing. And uh, we just let it happen because we were, like, freaked out. But that's what they want to do. They want to freak you out so you won't pray. So just don't be. All right, I know it's getting late. So um, let me just cover super fast, like, 10 minutes of inner healing, emotional healing, because there's many camps in the charismatic world that don't believe in inner healing. They don't believe in the healing of emotions for this reason. They say it was all done on the cross, which blows my mind because then why do you believe in physical healing and spiritual deliverance if you don't believe in... Isaiah 61 is clear that Jesus was dealing with the brokenhearted and the grieved. Um, that doesn't mean every single minute of our life where we had uh, sin and epic fail, other people against us, has to go through this process. But there are major points. I bet if you close your eyes right now, you could, each of you would have stuff come up that happened to you in your childhood. And it anchored some stuff. And then the Lord, in his kindness and mercy, wants to reinterpret that. Because children, they observe very keenly, but they don't interpret well. Say that again. They're keen observers, poor interpreters. Why? Because they're kids. But they observe everything. And then as they grow up with the pain of their childhood, they add their own meanings to make it make sense. And here's what you get. You had an abusive dad. All men are not trustworthy. You make, you make a 
you make a vow. And these vows cause you then to have open doors to demonic oppression. You might say uh, every teacher is untrustworthy because you had a teacher that did something to you. Or you might think I'm not, I'm never smart. I'm, I'm unintelligent because one teacher embarrassed you in front of, you wouldn't believe what the stuff that comes up in these inner healing things. So it's not, um, it's not psychotherapy. You're not a counselor. We're not, you know, going through the whole history of somebody. You're basically saying, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And the person says, I have anxiety. Well, for most people, if it's not biochemical, which it can be, it's mostly steeped in something that happened to you. So you go and you, you, you do a trade. It's a super simple thing of reframing a past hurt through the lens of Jesus. Okay. So without getting to, uh, into massive formulas and all this stuff, just to say, um, why don't you close your eyes and your imagination is sanctified. You need to say that to some people. And I want you to just imagine with the Holy Spirit, pray this prayer, say, Holy Spirit, what's the very first time when I felt anxiety in my life? If this is, a, if this is the issue, right? Immediately, people will get an impression of, oh my gosh, I was in you know, pre-K and this thing happened to me. Normally, it's around between ages five and seven because that's when you distinctively have a memory that sears you. And in that ages five to seven, you have this massive memory come flooding back. And most people will say this, man, I haven't thought about that in years. And they'll be like, wow. And then you just say, can you imagine yourself in that position? And you can take authority. You're the one who's praying right now. You say, I forbid any manifestation of trauma or PTSD right now in Jesus' name. So in other words, they can look at the memory of their life as an observer and not relive the trauma. Okay, is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Just say one more time. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine so, yourself then? Yeah, you, can you imagine yourself in that scene, right? Whatever the Holy Spirit's showing them, looking as an adult, looking at yourself in that scene, right? So you say, I, in the name of Jesus right now, no trauma is allowed to manifest. You can observe this like as, as a benign observer. You're looking at what happened to you. And then the best and quickest way for inner healing is to say, Jesus has been with you always. Even before you knew him, he was with you. So I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. So they say with their own mouth, Holy Spirit, show me where Jesus is. And sometimes they can't see him right away, but they can see a light or they can feel. But most people, I would say 95% of people can see him. And they see him and sometimes he's very far away because they feel like they were rejected. They were really hurt by this person. It could be massive abuse. But I always say, what would it be like if Jesus was closer? And they'll usually say, I would like that. And then they have to ask, and then I would say, ask Jesus to come closer. So they'll say, Jesus, would you come? Normally there's tears. Jesus comes closer and I'll say, what's happening now? Jesus has his arms around me. And then you say, ask Jesus what the lies are that you believe about this situation. Simple. That I'm not good enough. That I'll never be. That it was my fault. You know, that's a big one. Whatever the lie is, then if they have to forgive somebody, they need to do it right then. If that person stole their voice, stole their innocence, their, stole their purity, all those things need to be dealt with at that moment. And then at the end of all that, Holy Spirit will lead you, you guys. This is not formulaic. It's conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you say, after, you've, after they've forgiven the people, if that's the issue, and release the people, then you have them ask Jesus what the truth is about who they are. And then what you hear is unbelievable. They'll be speaking about who they are and the, and the power and the authority of, of God in them. And then what I try to, uh, what our teams do, it's, it's an exchange. It's a holy exchange. You can even do it in the way of a gift. You've just given Jesus all this pain. He wants to give you a gift. What's he given you? So you can do it either way. I like truth and lies because truth stick. Truth, Jesus is the person of truth. It sticks. But then they're in that scene, right? That's trapped them in their whole subconscious. So I will say, are you ready to leave that? And they'll be like, yep, I'm done. And I always say, Holy Spirit, is there anything else you want to tell them? 
And then they will leave as a little child observing with Jesus. And I'll say, ask Jesus to take you to a new place. Probably 90% of the time they go to an open field and that field has yellow and white flowers. I don't get it. It's, it is the place of freedom, but hands down, we could pray in Zimbabwe. We could pray in Illinois. Everyone goes to a field with white flowers or yellow flowers. I don't know. And Jesus, and I, what are you doing? Dancing. What are you doing? Running. What are you doing? It's just symbolic of, of freedom. So that's, that's enough on inner healing. You're going to know when inner healing is necessary, when you're praying for physical healing and nothing is happening. Then there is this root issue. All right. Um, any questions? <laughs> you guys are like, fire hose. That was so much information. Um, okay, let me explain this. So, so the Bible does not say go and do inner healing. But the Bible also doesn't call the Godhead the Trinity, but it's Trinitarian theology. Because of Isaiah 61 and other places, we know that Jesus was moved to compassion. Compassion includes emotions. And we know that Paul was super orderly in everything. But if <laughs> to look for a model of inner healing, the Bible is like trying to look for a sample church budget of Paul's. But you know that Paul had a church budget, don't you? Because that's who he was. He was super systematic. So we have to let the Bible inform and shape all of our healing ministry, but we have to be able to follow the Holy Spirit. And I have a list of prayers for inner healing. I'm talking about a list of scriptures that will back that up. If you want that, you can tell these guys and I'll send it to you. Um, anything, anything you have a question on? Should we ask them if they're saved at the beginning? Well, you like, can ask the Holy Spirit first. Okay. But they'll say yes, and they're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Welcome to the South. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they'll say they're safe. But ask Holy Spirit. Just say that they know. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, "Not like you think they do." Yeah. You can also tell by their language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? I don't want you to be nervous on Friday, but I, we'll, we'll do words of knowledge. So you just ask the Lord, what do you, simple, be childlike. Just go, God, what do you want to heal tonight? And then make a list, right? So we'll do it for physical healing uh, on tomorrow night, but God will also heal emotions and set people free. But the words of knowledge are easier for people to digest if they're physical uh, when the team hasn't done this together. Uh, because if you don't, if I don't give you the parameters of physical healing, you'll come in with the things, well, God wants to heal mental illness. And that is pretty, I mean, God can do anything, but that's pretty tough for a prayer team that hasn't worked together. Uh, we just had it happen uh, last week in Abilene <laughs> where we had other people join us and our prayer team and all the people that are not our prayer team came up and said mental illness, schizophrenia. I was like, dear God. Here we go. And all the schizophrenics and all the mentally ill came rushing to the front. And I looked at those people and I was like, because they didn't know what they were doing. And our team, I looked at our team and they, I, they were like, oh. they all go over there, try to fix all that. But you start with chaos and it's really hard to move forward. Now that God heals mental illness and schizophrenia all the time. He heals bipolar disorder. He's the God over all of it. But when you start with chaos, that's really hard to get back from that. Mm -hmm. So we try to start with physical healing and watch, again, the demonstration of the kingdom at work. Yeah. And then whatever is demonic on people is easier to get out because it's already started rolling. Now, last thing, I promise. Do not forget about the angelic. You don't talk to the angels, but God has sent his angels concerning you to lift you up with their hands so you won't even strike your foot on a rock. The angels of God are on the assignment on your life. From the time before God sent you here to be living in this time, God sent angels concerning you. Those angels are largely bored to death because we're not doing what God asked us to do. So as you start to operate with the power of the Holy Spirit, these angels are like, now we're talking, let's go. So make sure that you ask the Lord, 
in thanksgiving. God, thank you for the healing angels you're about to release in this room and the angels that are on assignment on my life and how much help they're going to give. Help me work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit and the angelic realm. Because you'll get an impression after you've been doing this a while that God might send angels of glory, angels of fire, angels of healing, warrior angels. I mean, he sends legions of angels to help us. And it's a whole lot easier to pray for the sick when you got angels doing it because they come and give new body parts. I mean, it's nuts. We, we've, I've seen people get, they had two destroyed kidneys, going to die in two weeks. No more dialysis, nothing. And they go back and get checked and they got two brand new kidneys. I mean, I have seen God do the most mind boggling things, but we always say thanks for the angels and what they're about to do to help us. Okay. Is that good? All right. Any other questions? You guys are like, no, I have to go home and think about this. <laughs> yeah? We feel a little bit silly. No. When you talked about um, faith and hearing the story loses your faith, mm -hmm. and I want to see healing happening, mm -hmm. but it's not happening. I felt like it's not desire, it's not emotions, but it's affected by the conversation. How do you, I don't know, can you explain a little bit about the faith that you are having as a substance when you're praying for mm -hmm. So it is not a, it's not a rule, right? Because God is God and we are not. So, but faith is a catalyst. So when, when the Bible talks about you having a mustard seed of faith, you can move this mountain from here to there. If you actually looked at the Hebrew of mountain, and even in the Aramaic, it, mountains can be symbolic for kingdoms. Literally, you can tell the kingdom of the dark to move it if you have tiny little faith, like childlike faith. Now, for it's a principle, but not a rule, okay? If the person has faith to be healed and you have faith to be healed, we see miracles because both are like a combustible, accelerated thing, but it's not a rule. People can have no faith and you could have faith, tiny, and God comes. You could barely have any faith and they have no faith and God comes rolling in and heals them. But usually as a principle, not a rule, they have faith, you have faith, the healing, boy, it's like, it's catalytic. I had a guy come in, fro he had been a uh, ruptured disc in, in C1 and C2 neck. Couldn't raise his arms past here uh, about six months ago. Comes to the al altar. We're like done praying for people. And I'm like, I, we're, we got to go. He's like, no. No, I drove so far and I could hardly drive. Like, you know, and, and he doesn't tell me a story. He just goes, I got ruptured C1 and C2 and God's going to heal me tonight. Like the dude was like, I was like, well, let's go pray for him. Every time I prayed, he tried to move his arms. I didn't have to tell him. He's obviously knows what he's doing. Every time I prayed. And then our team was laughing because they were all done praying. They all came around. They go, this dude has so much faith. 15 minutes later, boom. And he's laughing and his arms are up. He goes, that's right. That's right. God told me I was going to get healed. We're like, dude, go preach it on the streets. So sometimes you get that. He had so much faith. It didn't matter if none of us had faith. He was going to get his, right? So. Have you seen faith, faith like, like praying for someone's faith to increase while you're praying for mm -hmm. healing? Is that effective? Or usually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't usually do that. Here's what I do. I say, Jesus, please send so-and-so and so-and-so from our team who have a gift of faith. <laughs> if, Jesse, if Jesse was there, I'd be like, send Jesse over here right now. Holy Spirit, send Jesse over here. And then normally, they'll just walk over. Did you need me? Yeah. We used to have a symbol, and it was this. We went like, I need help. This was our team symbol. <laughs> Back in the early days, we were like, help me, Jesus. Somebody better get over here right now. I like, I'm so done. Yeah, rub your eyebrows right up. But now nobody does that anymore. Even our new people, we just pray, Holy Spirit, send so-and-so. So Ariel on our team has a gift of faith. A couple other people have gifts of faith. I will say, I'll literally say, Lord, send me Ariel, send me Julie, send me so-and-so. Julie's got authority over d demons like nobody else on our team. And if there's a demonic thing that is not moving, I'll be like, send Julie over here. And Julie will walk over, Mama, did you call me? No. You bet I did. Get in here and fix this. <laughs> He's, so the gift mix is, is wide open, but if some if you don't have faith, they don't have faith, you're really struggling, just pray. Lord, send Jesse over here. And she'll get the message because it just it's how the more you move together as a family, 
the more synchronistic this whole thing is. It's really weird. It's so cool. It's like the spirit of God in you. Because like you were saying before, like when you've gotten healing for something, you just naturally have more faith for that too. You do. So that's also the key of working together as a team because you'll learn mm -hmm. what people just have a greater like authority in because they just believe it. <laughs> it's true. And so that's when you'll be like, like I know if I'm praying for someone that's really down in like addiction, like, I'll always be like, Star, come over here. Yeah. <laughs> and it, she just has so much. Because she got delivered. Whatever yeah. you were delivered of, you have authority over, right? right. So any that. But ALS is an example of that. We never saw ALS healed. And I always wanted it to be healed. And then Randy, I asked Randy Clark about a year ago, hey, have you ever seen ALS healed? He goes, no, but I, I feel like, I go, come on. You've been doing this for how long? And he's like, 52 years. I go, well, I've been doing it nine. So we need to go after that. He goes, all right, we're going after it. And so about five months ago, he texted me and he goes, it just happened. Goliath has fallen, he texts me. <laughs> this woman got healed of ALS and another person they prayed for with ALS got 80% better. He goes, first time in 52 years. So I was like, that's it. I had just told that story to our team when the woman with ALS gets brought into that meeting in Brazil. CJ goes over and prays for her. And I text Randy Clark. I go, Goliath's head just got chopped off. He's like, come on. So when in, you don't have faith for things that intimidate you. So that's why you need family. And this is a family. So the more people in this family that are moving in an accelerated way, which you guys are, what you don't have faith for, someone else does on this team. And that's why it's good to pray in teams and vary it up, you know, change it up. Amen. Amen. We good? Really good. Okay. So Anything good. else? Man, I really, that's all right. On Friday, you're going to get activated. How's that going to work? Can I pray over them beforehand? Like I'd love to do impartation somehow over well, them. I would talk to you. <coughs> you can do it now. And because we still have a little bit of time. Um, but I would just like to pray. Look <laughs> at, okay. yeah, he's like, no. Well, I'm just saying, I don't know when it can be. Well, if everybody falls out, it, that you know, you'll be like, okay. Is there, so Friday night, what does that look like? So maybe, maybe, can I just suggest something? Could any of you that could get there a little bit early so I could, you know, have us, we could lay hands on you and pray for you? Because we don't give you anything, but we believe together that the Holy Spirit, since the Holy Spirit teaches us all things, 1 John 2, 27, and the Holy Spirit is the releaser of the gifts, right? That whatever gifts are on your life, we'd like to come into agreement with that, just like Paul did for Timothy before the event, because we've seen great acceleration when that happens. We're just basically agreeing with the Spirit of God and what he's given you uh, so that you'll move in boldness and courage. And so we'll do a Perfect. Okay, is that good? I mean, if you can't make it, okay, but... Is that okay? It's going to work? I have no faith. <laughs> oh, my God. Jesse has faith in Jesus' name. Okay, let's stand up. Father, we just thank you right now. We thank you that Jess has faith, and you're going to move mountains in 30 minutes tomorrow. Father, I thank you that you have brought us all together because you are about to do something brand new in this region. And Father, we are the beholders of your glory, and so we are the ones... Lord, that you plan to use. So we say once again, we surrender. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your angels in this room right now. God, you're just making me laugh. Lord, thank you that you are going to wreck the paradigms that we have put. Lord, I thank you. I'm just going to look. Okay. Father, thank you. Look, at see what Jesse does. Father, thank you right now. For the power of your spirit, just release. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. 
Come, Holy Spirit. We thank you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, every upgrade that needs to be released in this room right now in the name of Jesus, just pray let the power of God come right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Filler, 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 filler. <sighs> Signs and wonders right there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, say the power, the Spirit of God right there. Yo. Father, thank you right now. Thank you right now. Signs, wonders, and miracles will follow all who believe, said the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. The power of Jesus in this room right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Power, 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 power. Hey! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just bless what you're doing in this room, and we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Let the power of God come. Hey, 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 hey! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The power of God. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Hey! Shoo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. More, 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 more. Fill them up, God. Fill them up, fill them up, fill them up. More. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Right now. Power of God. Power of God. Hey! Rabbi Soul! Well, right here, right here, right here. Pillar. You have a Joshua anointing everywhere you put your feet. Everywhere you put your feet, the Lord's going to give you the property, the land, everything right now. Right now, right now. Thank you, Father. Hey! Come on, Apostle of God. Rabbas! Show! More, 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 more. Man, nobody recognized it until you got here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. More, more, more. Power of God. Right there. Right there. Fill it, fill it, fill it. Let it come. The Lord's giving you the healing gift over emotional trauma right now. Yes. Yes. Oh. Oh. Whatever tried to take you out, you're going to take it out. Yes. Open her ears, God. Open her ears. I see revelation power coming over you to deliver people from the demonic realm. Father, thank you for what she carries. That authentic joy right now. Right now, in Jesus' name. Let it come, let it come, let it come. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Power of God. Fill him. Fill him. Fill him. Fill him. You're gonna think new thoughts, and you're gonna think things about the kingdom. And when you think them and say them, God's gonna fulfill them. Wow. You're a big thinker. You have a heart. It's beautiful and kind. But you think before you feel. That's not a liability. Yeah. Wow. That's really good. It's not a liability. You are, you're like, no, I'm following you. I don't know what you're doing. You think, therefore you serve God with your mind. That doesn't mean you don't see it. But you're always going to get it in impressions in your head first. Say it and watch God. Wow. So Father, I thank you for the spirit. brilliance Whoa. of this man. I thank you for the intelligence on this man. I thank you, God, that you are filling him, filling him, filling him, filling him, filling him with a holy boldness right now to release a fresh word, God. And when he thinks it, it will be seared into his mind and then he will release it. And you will see, even though you're not a big manifester in the physical the power of God will fall on those who release those Thank words. Jesus. Wow. Wow. In Jesus Come on. The mind is not a liability. And in our camp, in these charismatic streams, people treat it like it is. Don't listen. Powerful, powerful. You're a revelator. Word of God. Word of God. Wow, another mercy. 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 Right there. Hey, Come, come, come. Come, come, come. Come, come. Come, come. Come, come. Mercy, 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 mercy is released every time you walk in the room. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Uh, you know, God gave you a get out of jail free card. That's so wild. You're like Monopoly. Pasco, Pasco, get out of jail free card. So I'm asking the Lord, why is that? Why is he on the Monopoly board? And the Lord said, because you 
have got the ability to set men free. Whoa! Yes. From all the sins and the hidden sin, the perversity, all the stuff. You have this ability to speak purity over men that are in bondage to sexual sin. Wow. And it is a get out of jail free card. So what God is going to use you for is you're a plain talker, truth telling, gentle man. Yes. But when you speak, the authority of God is so Amen. bold in your mouth. And you're going to be able to tell these people, look, you're addicted to porn. But mm. God has a new way for you. Yeah. You but you have the card. And it's Jesus on the card. Amen. Get out of jail. Jesus. So, Father, thank you for this. Now, what's your name? Kurt. Kurt? Yeah. Oh, Kurt. Got all our teams in jail ministry. <laughs> Father, thank you right now for, for this man setting captives free. Yes. Everywhere you go. And actually, you do have a jail ministry as well. Come on! <laughs> Oh, yes. Yes. I just thank you right now for the anointing that is on our people, that you would put that on this man. Whoa. Because, Lord, inside the prisons and outside the prisons, all men will be set free. Amen. Wow. Amen. Yeah, don't hold back. Yes. Wow. Wow. Oh, I still have a microphone on. I don't know what happened. <laughs> You're like, dude, over it. Yeah. Oh, maybe. So, Father, thank you right now. You have a teaching gift, amazing teaching gift. So, Father, we just pray right now that your glory fall on this one. That your glory fall. You'll be a mother to those who never had one. And I'll have you also be a father to them who never had one. God, thank you that she carries the lineage of community. Community and family. Yeah. Wow. This little prophet worshiper right here. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. The Caleb anointing. Yeah. Pay attention to your dreams. You're an amazing prophetess, and your dreams are a big deal to God. Wow. He's going to start giving you things for this community in your dreams. Wow. Uh, he trusts you. Yeah. You've led a lot of people to the Lord because you won't be moved mm. except by Jesus. Mm. And you're really nice about it. <laughs> That's you. I'm being made from all that. Mm. You and your husband are brought here for a very huge purpose. Wow. Mm. About restoring families. God's going to work miracles through you and your husband and what you're about to do with families. Wow. Mm -hmm. Families, I don't know anything about this region, but families, I hear what I hear, the Holy Spirit, families are ravaged in this region mm -hmm. by infidelity. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So the Lord, the Lord is really, yeah. <laughs> Lord is really going to use you to bring back covenant. Into marriage that doesn't yeah, look like religion. Because people have tried covenant in religion, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Covenant in relationship is a game changer. Mm. Oh, Amen. So <laughs> 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 Father, I thank you right now for this one. Holy so Soul, come with me. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for the love she has. I don't know that song's going through my head. I don't know much, but I know I love you. That's what you say. I don't know much, God. He's like, but you love me. Come yeah, Father, I just thank you right now. Yeah, you don't even know what you're doing half the time. You're like, I don't even know how I got here. But you're so radically obedient. Oh, yes. And listen, I want to tell you about the job that you have. Ooh. That job in retail. And you're like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm like, <laughs> but you are bringing a light into that community. Yeah. Wherever that yeah. store is or whatever yeah. it is. Wow. You're like, I feel like I'm wasting my time here. I'm going to tell you you're not. Because after, after tomorrow night, you're going to start praying for people in the store. Yeah. Amen. I don't know about yeah. people that own that store, yeah. but they're about to meet Jesus if they don't know Jesus. <laughs> you are going to pray for people in the store. And they're going to get mm -hmm. Yeah. Words of knowledge in the store, and you're going to get prophetic utterances, and then you're going to be like, come oh, on. I'm working there. This is my practice playground. <laughs> wow. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, Father, everything that is input within her, you are uh, very much, uh, you have an anointing like Esther. You have the favor of God, and people will tell you that over and over and over, you're going to hear it. 
for the next 10 years. Wow. <laughs> this anointing of favor of God wow. on your life never gets pulled back. Mm -hmm. The enemy just tries to interject doubt mm -hmm. that you don't have favor. Oh. Your family thinks you're kind of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but look at me. Oh. You're not nuts. They're like, what are you doing? That is crazy. You're going someplace with people you don't know. What are you doing? Yeah. And you're having to deal with those phone calls. You are to wash that stuff off at the end of that call. I know you, you pray before you get on those calls. But they're going to see what happens, and they're all going to be led to Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. And everything that is not of God right now, every harsh word, every condemning thing that has landed on you, sweetie, we just pull those arrows out of your back and we say the assault of the enemy in Jesus' name will not stick against you in Jesus' name. I love my family. And I'm not a disappointment. You're not a disappointment. To you. To you. You asked me to come here. You asked come on. Yes. And I'm calling my family. I'm calling my family. Into alignment. Yeah. With the promises that you gave us. Yes, with the God. promises that you gave us. And as for me and my family, that's cool. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. My family will all come in now. My family will all come Get out. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, open your eyes. Right at it. Spirit of fear. Spirit of fear. Get out. Place on me. Yeah. And you have no place on me. So leave. So leave. In Jesus' name. Jesus. I've forgiven them. I've forgiven them. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, right now, every traumatic word I say about me, you're Hey, Father, in Jesus' name, every traumatic cellular level, of every cellular memory trauma right now, go from her. Everything that came into your eyes, traumatic looks of disdain and contempt, go right now. Every word you heard through your ears of trauma, go in Jesus' name. Every smell, taste, and heart imprint of trauma, leave. Spirit of trauma, go right now. Yes. 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 Thank you, Father. We cut every tie. You got it. You got it. You got it. Okay. Every tie to that person, judgmental spirit, is gone. Yes. Cut from me, Jesus. Right here. So, Father, right now, there's fresh baptism coming. Okay. Take one big breath for me. Say everything not of God. Everything not of God. Please now. In Jesus, in Jesus' name. Okay, now, close your eyes. Take a really big breath. Come, Holy Spirit. Power of God, right there, right there. Right there. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey! Right now, you're going to go up, 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 up. Up, 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 up. Thank you, Jesus. John saw a door open. And he heard, come up here. Jesus. This is going to be your life. 
Come up here. Come up here in Jesus' name. You're going to see things before they happen. The Lord trusts you. You have a mighty prophetic gift. And the Lord is going to open up his heavenly realms to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Thank you, God. More, 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 more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And as you sleep, Father, thank you that you are the repairer of broken walls. Jesus, as she sleeps, all of her dreams will be restored to Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, I have a picture of you ice dancing, ice skating, and you're whirling around, and Jesus is looking right in your eyes. <clears throat> there's like when you twirl around, there's like a fire coming off of you. So I believe it's going to be as easy for you as a dance. If the Lord's holding on to you. There's nothing that you can't do. It's going to be a beautiful place. So Father, thank you for peace. Yes. Holy Spirit, we thank you right now for your fullness. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord has eyes for you. Lord, you only have eyes for you. Thank you. Thank you. Worship is such a part of your story. Mm -hmm. He always speaks to you in song. Mm -hmm. You are a mighty, mighty worshiper. Mm -hmm. And you're going to set a generation free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's going to make you irresistible to some of the hardest people. So you don't have to change. You just be yourself. You just stay with the whole house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, thank you. So much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I just asked for a fresh color to come here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I don't even know that Jesus. You are going to be people that are, this is weird for me to say, but you are going to be people who teach evangelism as a lifestyle. <laughs> wow. You actually have this mantle here. It's apostolic, but you're going to teach people how to live out of the overflow of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you're clearly addicted to the Holy Spirit. That is all you want. And that's why you're moving. So, Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for what's on their life. And you have kids. How many? How old are they? So, Father, thank you for these children that I also saw being raised up in the spirit. Whoa. So, God, everything that you uh, have given uh, to me, I ask, God, whatever matches the anointing on them, I just ask that you release that right now. Wow. Yeah. Hey! 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 Fire, 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 fire. You're also a businessman, you're an entrepreneur. And the Lord says that you're going to actually bring these brand new entrepreneurial ideas into business around here. You just got here, so you're like, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Whatever. You will start businesses here. God's going to give you favor, and He's also going to give you capital. The things that you left behind are nothing compared to what you started. Yes. Yes. And you become a spoke in a wheel, but actually, the Lord is saying what you carry together. Is the wheel is a paddle wheel picks up the water, which I know is Holy Spirit. So I see you guys first. You're a spoken wheel, and then you become a paddle wheel, and you pick up water, and that water carries up and over and becomes a catalyst. So, which I know is the power of the Holy Spirit for movement. So Father, I just thank you right now for what you have in your life. Yes, that they are yeah. catalytic yes. movers. Yes. They have power and presence yes. of Jesus. And Father, what you have on them, I thank you for business entrepreneurship. All married together with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. What they're going to birth, nobody has seen. Yes. The Lord says that in just about two years from now, you're going to say, it's as if we always lived here. Well, you're going to have so much favor with local people, they're going to stop asking you where you came from very quickly. And you're going to be assimilated into this area, which is hard to do. The Lord is telling me, this is a generational place people don't leave. You you are not foreigners, you're on God's terms. Oh, and God is actually going to make you ambassadors. Whoa. Hey. So, Father, I just thank you that they are ambassadors of reconciliation in uh, this region. And, yeah. and the people are going to hang around you wanting to know uh, who your parents were. And all of a sudden, they think you, you bored you, even without an accent. <laughs> so, Father, just thank you for favor and thank you for the anointing that they hear. Yeah. I also, okay, last thing. Yeah, watch. Okay, uh, I also see you guys meeting with younger couples. You're young yourselves, but younger couples, and they move here. And you guys got a lot of people moving here. I mean, and they're still in this home. <laughs> There's a lot. No, we're <laughs> You're going to be meeting with these young couples, and there's going to be ideas that are coming. They're like, I don't really know how to do that, but you will. You're going to know how to get people started in business. You have this catalytic brain that tells your systematic thinking. So you can tell things like from step A to step Z, this is what you need to do. And I believe that actually saturate and salt will be known for the entrepreneurs who come Yes. So Father, thank you that you walk in humility. You walk, both of you walk in such humility and yeah. integrity, but you also carry the joy of the Lord. So that mm -hmm. makes joy. you the mm -hmm. most unbelievable mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So Father, I just thank you right now uh, that your angels are in here to reset fight or flight right now. In Jesus' name. Father, everything uh, overloaded adrenal function and brain chemistry God, that has supported this uh, diagnosis of adrenal burnout in Jesus' name. We say, come into alignment with the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I thank you for your angels in this room right now just bringing a brand new adrenal cortex, a brand new adrenal system, God, in every place, Father, where it's flipped into fight or flight, call it back to a state of rest and peace. Thank you, Jesus, in your holy name, rest and peace. God, thank you for complete rewiring. So I just say to that norepinephrine chemical in your brain, call that back into alignment in Jesus' name, Father, thank you right now. 
Thank you, Jesus, for serotonin, norepinephrine, cortisol, our correct levels. In Jesus' name, right now. This overproduction of cortisol right now. Come into alignment in Jesus' name. Oh. We breathe. Hours of uninterrupted sleep. In Jesus' name, yeah. the Lord said, "It's not me waking you up. You need to sleep." Uh -huh. So I release you from believing that it's God who's waking you up. You seem to need to get up, and now your body's trained to get up. So, Father, I speak yeah. right now over yeah. all the areas of his brain that have been hardwired to wake after three hours. Lord, right now, sleep. I say eight hours uninterrupted in Jesus' name, right now. Thank you. Thank you. Full restorative REM sleep. Your dreams return to you. So dreams return to you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All manner of the imprint of fear over your back. Thank you. That something would happen to your family if you would do X, Y, Z. You're a good man. God's the provider. That's so where that line came in. It can just go up. You say, God. You know I trust you. You know I trust you. You're the provider. You're the provider. Not me. Okay. I take care of my wow. I take care of my wow. I command the spirit of the I command the spirit of the To lead me right now. Lead me right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For a brand new adrenal cord. For a brand new adrenal cord. Thank you for a new hypothalamus. Thank you for a new pituitary gland. Thank you for a brand new endocrine system. Thank you for a brand new endocrine Because I need it. Because I need it. And you're a good father. Thank you, Jesus. That I can go to bed tonight. Thank you to bed tonight. With my beautiful wife. My beautiful wife. And sleep. And sleep. In Jesus' name. The destroyer will not destroy. From all God, you bound these people. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I was 14 and a half years yeah. too, and I just laid my hand on you. Woo! 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 Woo!
Come on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, you're not going to like this one bit. I'm about to tell you, you're going to write a book. Uh, and the book is going to be about long wait, because nobody wants to wait. Yeah. Instant gratification culture, and if I don't get my way, I'm out. But I'm going to tell you, I told you both, if you both leave this plan of God and walk out, it was the best thing. But Jesus is worse, and every day was Jesus. And So, Father, I thank you right now for taking this and I thank you. They have no idea how glorious we have been here. <laughs> and it's about time. So, Father, thank you for the quick engagement. Thank you for weddings that catch people on fire. And we thank you that these two, hey, are about to find out that they were made for each other. And I'm going to tell you about your physical life. Your physical life together. So leave them alone, please. I'm just saying. <laughs> Sexuality is a covenant. It's the worship a husband and wife would have. I'm just letting you know that all this struggle and all this pain and all this stuff, that is going to be the thing that God will teach you. So it's going to be amazing. So, how do we go on a honeymoon for like two days? I'm going to be honeymoon for a very long time. <laughs> just tell these people that you need to go on a honeymoon. I don't know what you're doing, but you need to be away from people for at least a week. Oh, I don't care. Yeah. If you guys, if you guys could go for a couple of weeks, wherever, it would be very nice. Because God's going to show you something about this. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, I love these two. Thank you for the treasures they are. And to all of us. And so I ask for you for the new anointing that's going to come. That will fall on them on your wedding day when you meet this. Boy, it's going to be. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you. As our entire community comes together to bless this, to, to say thank you, God, for your presence. They are yes, and they are amen. God, it was great. Yes. And we thank you. Bless them, 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 bless them. Accelerating the gift of faith on both of you mm -hmm. to believe for the impossible. Mm -hmm. The Lord's going to bring you
back in the day, the junior, they go, there's a portal over here. They're running around, they're like, they're like, they're like they're actually, when you leave worship, angels come around and oh, they yeah. 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 have to all yeah. up into yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, so Father, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this sold out heart. Yeah. I'm so grateful. Um, the two of you coming here, that was hard. Uh, but you actually didn't make it look hard. You just were, you were like, man, yeah. that's our time. Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen is you're like, um, the Lord's showing me that like the five hyper where all the, you know, the rats fall. The rats fall. <laughs> you know, the thing is, people have rats in them, and I just see when you guys are leading, all these people who've been tormented just come flocking in to the region, and when they are worshiping, they get free. So I feel like you can download those words and all just like that, like really words of wisdom more when you're leading worship. Um, I, I want to tell you, I'm not in charge, but I'm hearing the Lord say you have free reign to release those words because when you do, people are going to get set free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a this is a new level of anointing you have for this thing. Uh, you, you've always had it, but now it's a whole new level because actually this is a move of God about to happen. Right so when you start to worship and the community is around you, when you release the word, God is getting ready to say. People free from this, it actually will happen, and you will have visitors in the crowd who don't even know why they're there. Get set. Come on, and they'll come to the altar and just give their life to Christ. You are a catalyst, a catalyst for salvation, but coming in a very different way. It's coming through surrendered worship. And so and you're gonna have a great time. Uh, yeah, I, I just see you being up there leading, and it's like these things are bombarded. They're like, well, and I see the angels, they actually are bombs of glory right now. Mm-hmm. And when you release it, all this stuff happens. Father, I thank you so much. You are the restorer. <laughs> He's the restorer of everything that was ever stolen from you. Holy Spirit, thank you that this is the best years of our life. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. The sun sets for you, man. It's mm-hmm. And you have your own Jesus dance party. Right? <laughs> 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 you know what I see? I, I, I know that when we had camp, you were in the kitchen, but I actually see you in the kitchen, which I know is the heart of God. And you're in the kitchen, and you're cooking for everyone. This is not what you do, but this is the heart of God. When you are talking with people, you're the heart of God. Yes. Wow, yeah, yeah. They know that God delivered you out of the mouth mm-hmm. of the lion. Yeah. Yes. When you tell them, they know their soul. Yes. You have the power to speak yes. over people who are addicted and lost and have been for generation upon generation. And I see the Lord saying, no without the power of your simple faith. Because your simple faith is why this guy's not here. <laughs> and your faith. Is why they're here. Wow, come on. Come you on. Pray. Yeah, thank you, Lord. You pray because you know what it means to the one who's been forgiven by the Lord. Much so is expected. <laughs> but what God expects from you is just what you do. You lay down your heart every yes. day and you go, God, just you. <laughs> and don't have much. Just You're about to see a catalytic change in your own life that no more will you be tormented by the past. You will not visit it anymore. Since that, you know, back in the day, there was a card catalog in a library. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, or for a good book. And I was so, yeah, do we just yeah. never could figure that thing out? But I saw the demonic open up all the drawers. And say every single card in here represents something about you. And you know what the Lord did? He closed all the doors and he set the library on fire. So, Father, I thank you right now. Put your Holy Spirit, I thank you right now that you burn the history. Because you're the history maker. So, Holy Spirit, right now we say, fresh and morning come. Because she's carrying the heart of the Father. Yeah.
step out and they're constantly stepping out. God, I thank you for their children. I feel like I'm supposed to say this to you, that your children will never be ministry orphans. In Jesus name. It's been a concern of yours and I just feel like you've already done a lot of protecting of them but you, you need to know that you don't need to worry. That the Lord uh, has already put a fence around them uh, and anything that the enemy tries to do to trip up that business because the Lord knows. The cost. Yeah, your family. So, Father, I thank you. Um, and the Lord says to never think of this entire thing as a do over, but to think of the first thing as if it happened. Which is a different way of thinking. So, Father, I thank you that you make all things new, which means the old things are as if they were. So, whatever that is, that sometimes comes up. In Jesus' name, take that burden off. The Lord said this When I unyoked you, I unyoked you from an oxen's yoke, which was so heavy and burdensome. And that is no longer on you because you never put it there. Other people do. Wow. So the un unspoken expectations of the people are what mm -hmm. became a heavy. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said that will never again land on you. Mm -hmm. Because you're not wiser. And you have seen in Revelation over and over in the Word what it means to have everything before. Mm -hmm. 
So hear the Lord say, the word and the depth of your word study is going deeper and deeper and deeper, and deeper. so is your. But the word is also going to mark you with miracles that people can't explain. Yeah. So you need to know that that's actually coming. Yeah. Uh, there are going to be people with conditions in this community and people that fly to these meetings. Yeah. Their family members bring them. And they're, it, it, all hope is gone. And you as a tribe are going to pray for them. And they're going to get, they're going to get delivered, healed, set free. And so this is such a signpost yeah. that surely God is with you. So now that the land has been, uh, this is the land. I feel like the Lord's telling me, and you already know this, the fragrance of blueberries on the land, it's a very marked scent. Yeah. The scent of Jesus on the land is going to be more pronounced than that. Yeah. Right. You also need to know that there's already a prolific harvest on the land of blueberries, but watch the harvest of the Lord. Well, so all these prophetic promises that you already know are true, when you went and you looked at it, you were like, of course these are prophetic utterances of the Lord. But I hear the Lord and I, I hear that song, you ain't seen nothing yet. Well, <laughs> I, the Lord speaks to me as well. So um, I just hear that song being sung over you, and you have great tools. Mm -hmm. But you truly ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> uh, it's going to be an amazing time. In the next six months are going to be like the, like if you put, you know, you're trying to pedal uphill and then you put a motor on the bike and just zips up the hill. It's like in the next six months. So, Father, I thank you that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You own the hills. You own the storehouses. You own the warehouses. You own it all. And so, God, I thank you that these are trustworthy people. These are trustworthy son and daughter. God, I thank you that you have more than they could ever uh, hope or imagine, dream, or even think as far as economics and as far as uh, salvations. God, yeah. when they hey, when they decided to do the baptisms, God, nobody was doing that. Yeah. And now people are doing that because they're So, Father, thank you that as, as these uh, apostolic ambassadors, they're going to be trendsetting. And, the spirit. and so you never have looked around to see what everybody else is doing. You look around. Which is actually really exciting. Uh, and that's why you hang around with Jeremiah. Wow. But, uh, there's not many people like you who don't give a crap without having an attitude. So I understand that you don't give a crap, but you're like, what? what you do you? We'll do that. Most people, if they don't give a crap, they sling mud at you. But you don't. And you truly have overcome. <laughs> And Jesse, you're such a good friend, sweetheart. Yeah. And what happened to you, sweetheart? You didn't anticipate. Yeah. Okay, so if you're not sweet, you want to say. It's never going to happen. Okay. Okay, so look at me for a second. Look at me for a second. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I don't have to guard my heart that much. I have to go in the And she said, I don't want to it too much. It's never going to happen again. Because it's never going to happen again. And it wasn't my fault. You say that. But I realized for me, it really happened. It wasn't my fault. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, I tried so hard. I tried so hard. Thank you. And I've forgiven them. And I've forgiven them. So everything they took from me. So everything they took from me. I take back from them. I take back from them. And everything I took from them. And everything I took from them. I give back to them. I give back to them. In Jesus' name. Thank you. I break any soul tie. <laughs> I break any soul tie. That I have with them. That I have with them. Yes. It's done. It's finished. It's finished. And this lying spirit, this lying spirit tells me I can't trust people with my heart. That tells me I can't trust people with my heart. Is the lie. 
It's a lie. So get away. So get away. Lying thief. Lying thief. We finished. Yeah. We are finished. I'm free. I'm free. Hey. It's a love who I want to love. It's a love who I want to love. And to be loved. We're very loyal. We're very loyal. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Come on. First of many, many. Mm -hmm. So this is a blueprint. It's like a holy blueprint. And I see it came down to them, and it was a lot for them to, to take this on at this particular moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed fairly ludicrous in the natural. But uh, because you did say yes, you guys get to multiply this. And it will be year round and it will grow different. So this is like blueprint people, all of your leaders. So if you don't know that yet, say yes, yes I am. <laughs> because that's why you're here. So this is like leadership explosion camp. That's what the school is about. The next is going to look a little bit different. And I, I really feel like because you all are here, this is going to be catalytic in what you can do in this camp. So you're not following uh, exactly. Next thing is going to be that much bigger, but it will not cost you more energy. Mm -hmm. You also uh, on the property. I don't know how it's going to be allocated, but your offices are going to be back at your home. Mm -hmm. To have that office be a mm -hmm. Because there's an angel that's in that office, yeah. and it stands there and guards the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, but I see it's guarding. It's like an angel of peace guarding the atmosphere for your individual mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that is corporate will move on to. Because when your kids come into that place, they know you just see Father, we just thank you for everything that you did tonight. God, thank you that we're right on time at 10.10. Amen. And thank you that you are the perfect God. And even when Parker was like, no, we don't have time. Just <laughs> <laughs> the Lord came rolling in. Father, thank you that Jesse just prayed and it happened. <laughs> I'm so grateful for this couple. I'm so grateful for what you're doing, Father. Uh, I know that uh, tomorrow you want to do even more. And so yeah, tomorrow. we just thank you with all our hearts. Just so grateful to you, Jesus, for what you do that just shocks and amazes us all. Thank you for bringing me to this amazing community and just making me family. I'm so grateful God, that we get to run with you and what we get to see you do with Bibles and so, Lord, would you use us all up for your glory? And tomorrow, when you see, Lord, people get set free, saved in the yeah, yeah. Jesus, we thank you ahead of time for your holy angels. Send legions of them, God. We need it. Yeah. And Lord, uh, I just command any spirit of intimidation that would try to lodge its way onto your people. I say you're off limits. In Jesus' name. And I thank you, Jesus that our countenance is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So as we leave this place, Lord, with our hearts on fire, we know that we can rest secure in the one who conquers us. So we thank you for your yes and amen over our lives, that we get to live here and be the catalyst to set our screen and lead into your throne. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do. Bless your son and daughter. Jesus, Jesus. Thank you.